She committed a quadruple homicide, and her reason for it was one I have never really heard of before. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the Attar family. Viewer discretion is advised. This case occurred in Lake Jackson, Texas in the year 2000, and it happened at the now-closed Wood Hollow Apartments. 18-year-old Omar Attar was married to Felicita Attar, and they had a one-year-old son named Omar. Omar Sr. had a twin brother named Daniel, and this is all of them pictured together. Omar and Felicita had only been married for about four months, and they were living in a one-bedroom apartment there. Now, Daniel Attar did not live with them. He actually lived at home with his parents. But on this particular evening, he was actually staying the night at his brother's apartment. Living just below them was this couple here, Sadie and David Prophet. On October 10th, 2000, Sadie calls 911 and says that there's a dead man inside her apartment. It's her husband. And this was because of a fire that broke out. Around the same time she made that 911 call, Felicita also makes a 911 call screaming because her apartment's on fire and she has a baby inside the apartment. When fire and rescue arrives, however, it is too late. All four Atar family members are found dead inside their apartment, including the one-year-old baby. They had all died from either smoke inhalation or from the fire directly. Also found dead in the apartment below was David Prophet. He was 50 years old. Sadie tells police initially that when she called 911, she says, ah, my husband, he must have fallen asleep with a cigarette in his hand because he was on fire. She said he had been up and moving around, but the thing is, is he was actually wheelchair bound from having a stroke and he was found dead sitting in his recliner. When the coroner does the autopsy on David, they find out he was already dead before the fire. He died of natural causes. That's when they discover after some time, that Sadie Prophet deliberately set that fire. She did so because if her husband died accidentally, like in a fire, she would get a much larger payout from the insurance, as opposed to if he died of natural causes. So she set that fire on purpose. She also claimed that she called 911 multiple times, but the phone was busy, but they said that's a lie. And she also claimed she was screaming fire, fire outside her apartment so that everyone around her could get out. But no one can corroborate this. I had never heard of someone setting a fire deliberately in order to hide a natural death to get more insurance money. And then in the process, she actually murdered four innocent people. So Sadie Prophet was charged with all four of their murders. So Sadie Prophet goes on trial for the quadruple homicide and she is eventually found guilty of all four murders and she is given 60 years for each murder. But she was given the option to have parole after 30 years. She was battling a lot of, I guess, health issues in recent years and she was paroled early due to those health concerns. I'm sorry, but keep her in prison. That's... But at any rate... She actually ended up dying in 2020. I, I believe she only actually spent about nine or ten years in prison. She was released into a senior uh, health facility where she would eventually pass away. I don't know. I guess I'm just one of those people where if, like, they're having health issues, health concerns, gee, I'm sorry, but you've murdered people. And I don't think that should give them a pass to be released. I just don't. These four individuals, including a baby, died in such a horrific way, burning alive. If the person who caused that just happens to get sick while in prison and like really badly sick, sorry, treat them in prison, I guess. I don't know. I just don't feel like it's proper justice, but I could be wrong. Was a deadly arson related to a potential bank robbery? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the Baldeo family murders. Viewer discretion is advised. 45-year-old Donna Baldeo was a single mother to two children. She had a 22-year-old son named Jalal and an 8-year-old daughter named Bunny. Donna was a branch manager at a local Wells Fargo bank. And on December 22, 2001, Donna would arrive at work first. When she arrived, she noticed that there was a note in a clear plastic sleeve that basically was saying, Hey, we're going to rob you. And the note said, you need to comply with what we say in this note. You need to do what we do. And if you deviate from any of this, there will be violent retaliation against you. 
So Donna gets into her car and she awaits for the next employee to come and she kind of secretly meets that employee and says, hey, we got a problem. And then they go to police. She did exactly what the note said not to do. But police have never been able to find the author of this note. They got no forensic evidence from it, no fingerprints, and the bank was never robbed. Five weeks later, here at the Chateau Dijon apartment complex, which is located in Houston, Texas, this is where Donna and her two kids lived. It was 3.30 a.m. on February 1st, 2002. The family was all asleep in their beds. And this is when another neighbor of theirs, a man named Curtis Ford, he woke up to the sound of like a lot of running up and down these stairs outside of his apartment. When he got up to look out the window, he noticed just like this giant ball of fire that just shot out through outside of his window. And he managed to just barely escape his apartment. 911 was called, firefighters arrive, and they managed to put out the flames. However, they are horrified to find that there are three people, one of who was pronounced dead at the scene and two who were very critically injured with burns all over their body. The deceased individual was eight-year-old Bunny. 22-year-old Jay Law was rushed to the hospital, where sadly he passed away from his burn injuries just a few hours later. 30 minutes after him, his mother Donna, who was also rushed to the hospital, she died as well. An entire family killed. And police initially thought, well, this could very well be connected to that potential bank robbery. The note did say, well, we're going to threaten you with violence if you don't comply. But they couldn't find any corroborating evidence to that. And then it turns out it had nothing to do with that. In July of 2002, family members of a 14-year-old boy named Timothy Perkins would go to police and say, I think that he may have done this. Several other fires had been committed at this apartment complex in the months leading up to the deadly one. Turns out, Timothy and a 13-year-old accomplice, they set the fire because they were drunk and stupid. Timothy was sentenced to just 12 years in prison. He was released, as well as the second unnamed boy. She vanished from a bar into thin air, and now the question still remains, what happened to Brenda? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Brenda Condon. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Brenda Condon was a 28-year-old mother to two children, and she was living in the area of Spring Township in Pennsylvania. At the time, Brenda had recently gotten a job as a bartender at this building, which used to be the Carlsbad Tavern, which I guess is in Belfont, Pennsylvania. It was February 27th, 1991. Brenda was seen there working at the bar and she was working alone. The last confirmed sighting of her was between 12.45 a.m. and 1.15 a.m. Brenda was supposed to close up the bar that night, but when her fellow employees got there the following early afternoon or so to open up, the door was already unlocked and Brenda's car, which looks like this, was still in the parking lot. However, Brenda was nowhere to be found. In the men's bathroom, they found a pair of black boots, which were later confirmed to be Brenda's boots. To this day, nobody knows why those boots were off of her feet and why they were in the men's room. The bar itself had no forced entry. There was no sign of a struggle, no blood, nothing. Nothing appeared to have been stolen and cash was still there. As a matter of fact, on the bar itself was a bottle of uh, beer and a, I think a couple dollars in cash, which to one detective kind of indicated something to him because Brenda had already taken all of the money from the bar and put it away in the safe, which means the cash that was left on the bar that night was a tip to Brenda, meaning it likely came from the final person who was in that bar. These are composite drawings of three individuals who had been seen at the bar at the time close to when she would have last been seen. These men have always just been wanted for questioning. They're not necessarily suspects. They just want to know if these men saw or heard anything. And possibly one of them might be someone who did something to Brenda. Brenda never picked up her two kids when she was supposed to. So she was reported missing at that point. But because there was no sign of foul play at the bar itself, they don't know what happened to her. I know they've looked into her boyfriend that she had at the time. I believe he had an alibi. They also looked into the owner of the establishment and they were able to rule him out. One detective believes that foul play was definitely involved here and that Brenda is likely deceased. 
But the question remains, who did this to her? And where did they put her? Where is she? There really isn't any forensic evidence or anything. So they need your help. If you have information, please call 814-355-7345. It would take 47 years to identify this killer. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Carol Sue Claber. Viewer discretion is advised. Carol Claber was born on November 28, 1959, and she was an only child. She was born in Covington, Kentucky, and Kentucky is where she lived her entire life. 16-year-old Carol would be reported missing on June 4, 1976. She left her home earlier that day on her bike and she was planning on just taking a quick little bike ride, but she never got home. The following day in Boone County, Kentucky, which was just a little bit uh, west of Cincinnati, Ohio, and on the side of a road in a ditch, the body of 16-year-old Carol Sue Claber was found. Carol had been beaten and ultimately she was strangled to death. The coroner also determined that she was definitely sexually assaulted, and that was likely the motive behind this whole thing. Witnesses said they saw Carol at one point getting into a white vehicle with a man driving it who looked like this. But I guess nobody recognized the man. Nobody could tell if she knew him, if he knew her, or even if this guy had anything to do with what happened to her. They never really found out who this was, at least not back then. The case went cold and then just kept getting colder and colder. They were getting no tips, no leads, nothing to work with. They had some forensic evidence, but back in 1976, there just wasn't much they could do with it. Then suddenly in 2023, they finally announced, we have a suspect. We know who killed Carol Sue Claver. They identified him as a man named Thomas Dunaway. Thomas died in 1990. Thomas Dunaway only lived a mile and a half away from where all of this took place. They don't know even now if he knew Carol or if Carol knew him or if this was a complete stranger situation. But just a few days after Carol's murder, he joins the U.S. Army. But not too soon into his endeavor there, he abandons it. And Thomas Dunaway, pictured here, would go on to murder someone else, a man named Ron Townsend. A photo of Ron I cannot find. And that murder took place in northern Kentucky. He was eventually captured for that murder and he confessed to it. He only served seven and a half years. But back in 2022 or so, detectives resubmitted evidence from Carol's case to see if they can pull any DNA from it, and they could. They were able to create a profile, which then using forensic genealogy, it led them to family members of Thomas Dunaway. Then they were able to narrow it down specifically to him. But he will never face justice because he died in December of 1990. He was never on the radar of police back then. He will never face legal justice. Hopefully he's serving justice in hell. Jesus. Okay. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Carrie Love. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Carrie Love was 20 years old and living in Seattle, Washington. She was working essentially as a secretary for a trucking company called North Star Trucking, a company that was owned and operated by a man who looks like a cinder block with a beard, Mr. Jesse Pratt. Well, on June 16th, 1986, Jesse had asked Carrie if she would accompany him to Los Angeles in his truck because he was apparently thinking of opening up another location there. Carrie kind of begrudgingly agrees. She was dating another guy at the time and he was concerned about her being with this guy in this truck alone. And she assured the boyfriend, you know, if Jesse does or says or tries anything, I'll get out of the truck and I will call you. But Carrie also, her father was living in Los Angeles, so that was another reason for her to go. So people did feel more comfortable, I guess, about that too. So they leave on June 16th, 1986, and then Carrie is never seen or heard from again. Their drive initially would take them along Highway 97 near Klamath Falls, and it was just the following day when another person driving a truck found something on the side of this road. It was a green sleeping bag, and so the person, thinking it was abandoned, scooped up the, the bag and put it into his truck. 
but later on he actually opened up the sleeping bag and in it he found a bloody shoe, a bloody purse, and the driver's license of 20-year-old Carrie Love. So he immediately goes to police with what he has. As they're doing that, they are checking out the entire area to see if they can find anything else. Well, they finally come across this sort of desolate uh, truck stop that's like 25, 30 miles away from where the purse was found. And there is all this like big piles of gravel on the side of this road where the stop is. Obviously, I can't show you this, but they do some digging around and underneath a pile of gravel, they find a body. It was the body of a female who had been stabbed and also she had been asphyxiated. And there was also indications that she was sexually assaulted. This body would eventually be confirmed to be that of 20-year-old Carrie Love. Near the body, they also find this big pile of paper towels that's been like put together with duct tape. And one of the forensic analysts actually sees kind of the impression of a face on it. It was clear to them that this had been used to likely smother Carrie Love to death. Another horrifying thing they discover is that on her arm there appears to be tire treads. Whoever did this literally ran over her body with his truck. So police, because the North Star Trucking Company phone number was found in the belongings with the sleeping bag, police do contact it to see if they can, you know, reach out to anyone there. They also go to that business. And as they enter the building, they're actually, they notice that one of the employees is on the phone. They're actually talking to Jesse Pratt. So police take the phone and say, hey, we need to talk to you. We have some questions because this girl you were with, Carrie Love, she's dead. He tells them, well, I'm in, I'm passing through Phoenix, Arizona right now. So it'll be a while. Well, not for police because they end up traveling down to Phoenix and they find him. He gets pulled over and he is brought in for questioning slash arrested. He tells police a story that initially uh, Carrie changed her mind pretty quickly about going to Los Angeles with him. And so he dropped her off near the Seattle airport. But after being accused of lying about that, he changed his story again. He said, well, okay, Carrie was with me. We had consensual sex, and then I found out she stole money from me, so I booted her out of my truck, and I took off. I, I left her alone in a dark, desolate place. But then they searched his truck, and they found a roll of Bounty paper towels, and it turns out they were the exact paper towels that were found with duct tape near Carrie's body. They also found red fibers underneath Carrie's, I guess, fingernails, and they ended up matching a red t-shirt that he was actually wearing when he was arrested. The fibers were microscopically similar. They also would look at the tires of his truck. They noticed that the pattern looked very similar to the ones left on her arm. When they had a tire tread expert analyze the arm plus the tires and everything, it was the exact tire that had run over Carrie's arm. I do want to note that in the sleeping bag, they actually found male bodily fluid. And they also found male bodily fluid in Carrie. However, the one that was in the sleeping bag ended up matching her boyfriend. Well, this was Carrie's sleeping bag, and the boyfriend said, yeah, we had sex the night before on that sleeping bag, the night before she left. Uh, to my knowledge, though, they haven't tested the semen that was in Carrie herself. But there was enough evidence to charge the Kroger brand version of a Bigfoot, Jesse Pratt, with her murder. The evidence against him was overwhelming, and there was just, you couldn't deny it. They found him guilty and he was convicted, but then that was overturned at some point, but then he was on trial a second time and he was found guilty once again, and this time sentenced to death, where to my knowledge, he is still awaiting his execution. And this was in Oregon because Carrie was killed in Oregon, but she got justice. This is Worst Workplace Disasters. Viewer discretion is advised. I guess this would technically be a new series. Pictured here is the Foundation Food Group plant in Gainesville, Georgia. It is a poultry processing plant. I guess Gainesville, Georgia is considered to be the poultry capital of the world. There are several plants like this that employs thousands of people. Now at these plants, and this one in particular, they have these massive liquid nitrogen tanks, which from what I understand helps freeze their, you know, big giant freezers. 
At 10 o'clock in the morning on January 28th, 2021, due to a bent tube, well, it would cause a liquid nitrogen leak inside one of these freezers. The freezer filled with liquid nitrogen, which then vaporized into four to five foot tall clouds. Three employees went in to check on what happened. They began to asphyxiate immediately. Within minutes, they were dead. Then a few more employees entered the freezer to help save those people, and the ones trying to help also asphyxiated immediately and died. Several other employees were hospitalized, but would recover. It was blamed on poor training, poor maintenance, and it was completely preventable. But six people died slow, agonizing deaths. The plant had to pay out $74,000 in violations, and I know the families of the victims sued, but I don't know the exact outcomes. The answer to a 26-year-old murder mystery was really close to home. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Christopher Hervey. Viewer discretion is advised. Christopher Alex Hervey was born on August 30th, 1973. And at the time this case occurred, he's living in Santa Ana, California. Christopher was a musician. I believe he was a part of a band. It was something he was really passionate about and something he was very good at. At the time this case occurred, he is dating a woman named Jade Benning. Both of them are 22 years old, and they are living here in this apartment building in Santa Ana. At approximately 3 o'clock in the morning on January 4th, 1996, Jade Benning calls 911 in a panic that her boyfriend has just been stabbed. The police arrive to the apartment on North Broadway Street, and she says that the two of them were just hanging out in the apartment when an unknown black male entered the apartment and attacked them. And this man, who she didn't know or didn't recognize, and apparently neither did Christopher, just started stabbing Christopher. And then the man just leaves. Christopher is then rushed to the hospital where he never regains consciousness, and unfortunately he would be pronounced dead a few hours later. According to witnesses at the apartment complex, they heard the sounds of a loud argument happening sometime shortly before the police were called. But unfortunately, they just did not know who this unknown intruder was or why he even did this. It seemed very odd to a lot of people, but they had no evidence to show who this was. So the case goes cold very quickly. In 2001, Jade moves out of California and she moves to Austin, Texas. Then, in 2020, police in Santa Ana, California get an anonymous letter stating that they know who actually stabbed Christopher Hervey back in 1996. It was none other than his girlfriend, Jade Benning. So police begin to question some witnesses from when the case initially happened. They also take some, I guess, evidence they had. They re-examined it, and now they have forensic evidence, even though they haven't said what it is, that confirms or at least links Jade Benning to the actual stabbing. So in May of 2022, Jade Benning is arrested in Texas, and then they begin the extradition process to bring her back to California. She is charged with the murder of Christopher Hervey, her and her alone. And she made up the story about this black man entering the apartment. It's funny how they always lie and they always say it's a black person. However, I don't have any other updates since that. I can't find court documents or anything. So this case still appears to be ongoing. He was last seen walking away from this apartment complex and he has never been seen again. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Craig Freer. Viewer discretion is advised. Craig Freer grew up in the Schenectady area of New York, and I know for a fact that he had at least one brother. At the time this case occurred, Craig was 17 years old. He absolutely loved his family. He had plenty of friends and a girlfriend. He was actually soon to be starting his senior year at high school where I guess he was captain of his school's soccer team, and he was really, really good at it. But on June 27th, 2004, 17-year-old Craig Freer would vanish off the face of the earth. The last that anybody knows, Craig was here at Cambridge Manor Apartments uh, hanging out with some friends. This is an aerial view of those apartments. You can kind of see there's some wooded areas around it, and there's also like a train track. 
So Craig was allegedly seen going towards this wooded area, and he was seen walking along these train tracks. But then he kind of just seemed to just disappear into the woods, and nobody has seen him ever again. He wouldn't be reported missing until, I think, July 2nd. I, he was last seen on June 27th, so I don't know why there was such a large gap in a time there, considering he was 17 years old. He was a kid. But what his family found out was that he was kind of trying to lay low for a while. He had been working at a job at Price Chopper in Glenville, but apparently two weeks prior to this, he left his job. Or he got fired, I'm not 100% sure, but he didn't tell his parents. And it sounded like he was kind of nervous to tell his parents that he lost his job. But did that have anything to do with his disappearance? It's really not known. Craig had no cell phone. He had no identification on him. He only had a few bucks in cash. I don't think he had a bank account. His social security number has not been used one single time since his disappearance. There was one alleged sighting of him, they said sometime between June 27th and July 2nd, where he may have been seen in the passenger seat of a car. And this is according to someone who knew Craig. But the person who saw this really couldn't describe the car and didn't really know who was driving it. And it's not even 100% sure that that was Craig that he saw. They did a very extensive search with volunteers. They have done like ground searches and they have looked into bodies of water. Craig wasn't known to be suicidal or depressed or anything like that. But you figured if he ended his own life somewhere in those woods, you would have found him by now. It's been 20 years. No sign of him, no trace of him has ever been found. And there's really very little information about this case. If alive, he may look something like this. If you have information, please call 518-457-6811. Hello, true crimeers. This is the disappearance of Deborah Hohenschild. Viewer discretion is advised. This case occurred here in Daytona Beach, Florida. Deborah Ann Hohenschild was just 26 years old, living there in Daytona. Deborah did some real estate work in Ormond Beach, Florida, but she also worked on the side at the Fisherman's Wharf restaurant in Daytona Beach. On February 13th, 1988, this is exactly where she was working that day, and everything seemed to be fine. And they know for a fact that Deborah got home because she actually made a phone call from her apartment to who police have not said and or that person has not really come forward to my knowledge. There's actually very limited information on this case. But 26-year-old Deborah did not show up for work the next morning. She didn't call. This would prompt her boss to report her missing. And he asked police if they could do a welfare check on her at her apartment, and they do so. When police arrive, they're able to gain entry to her apartment. She is not there, but there is, what they said, obvious signs of a struggle taking place there. There was a broken lamp. There was a comforter and some sheets missing. And then on another sheet on her bed was blood. And they found two teeth located, uh, I guess, somewhere in the bedroom as well. I'm assuming that they've identified those teeth as two belonging to Deborah. I'm not sure, actually. They've done, like, a DNA test on them. But I, they, I believe they think those are her teeth. Her cats were still in the apartment, and she loved her cats. She would never just abandon them like that. Her car was found less than a mile away, which was kind of unusual. There were people where the car was found said that that car had been there since Sunday, which would have been the day after she disappeared. But no sign of a struggle or any, like, blood or anything inside the car. Deborah did have a boyfriend at the time, but police checked out his alibi. It was a pretty rock-solid alibi, according to them. And he's not considered a suspect per se. Maybe kind of like just sort of a, a person of interest, possibly. But it doesn't sound like they think he directly did anything to her. And what was the motive? I mean, Deborah didn't really have much. She didn't, she really couldn't afford a whole lot. She didn't have like super expensive jewelry. She wasn't someone to have a lot of cash on her. Was this like an attempted robbery that someone broke in randomly and maybe she was there or walked in on it? Was she targeted, but by who? It was obvious that a very violent attack took place in her apartment and her grandmother who actually raised her said she believes that Deborah was killed inside the apartment and then disposed of. Her mom died about a month after she was born of cancer, and her dad died a year before this happened. But someone out there has to know what happened to her and where she is. If you have information, please call 
5100. If the door was closed, how did the victim's brain matter get on her wall? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Alan and Diane Johnson. Reviewer discretion is advised. Diane and Alan Johnson lived with their two children in Bellevue, Idaho. They had a son named Matt and a daughter named Sarah, and they seemed to be a very happy family. They lived in a pretty large home on a very large property, and essentially they got and had whatever they needed and whatever they wanted. The close-knit family loved to go outdoors and go hiking and camping together, and you just never would think that there was any humongous issues within this house. It was the morning of September 2nd, 2003. The oldest son, Matt, was out of state in college, but Sarah was still living in the home with her parents. She was 16 years old at the time of this case. She awoke to the sounds of loud gunshots coming from within the home. When she opened her bedroom door, she looked into her parents' room and found both of them had been shot to death. There was blood spattered all over the walls, and it appeared that her dad had been shot while getting out of the shower, and there was blood all over the shower. There was even a bullet hole in the other end of the shower. The murder weapon, a rifle, was found inside the home. Other than the bloody crime scene within the bedroom, the rest of the house seemed relatively normal. There was no forced entry into any windows or doors. Nothing was ransacked, nothing was stolen. They also had a guest house on the uh, next to their property, and living in that house was a friend of Diane and Allen's, uh, Mel Spiegel. Well, Mel seemed to be missing all of a sudden, and they also found a gun part on his bed that matched the murder weapon. So they said, okay, Mel did this, and he's on the run. However, police tracked him down. He was out of town. He had been for some time. It was confirmed without a shadow of a doubt. He had an alibi. He did not do this. Then police found out that 16-year-old Sarah, the murdered victim's daughter, was dating a man named Bruno Santos. He had a criminal history and the parents did not like him and did not want him involved with Sarah. So police were like, great, Bruno Santos is now our suspect. However, they were able to obtain uh, DNA from like the murder weapon and whatnot. That DNA did not match Bruno Santos, but it did match someone else. Their 16 year old daughter, Sarah. Well, Sarah said she was asleep in bed when these murders happened and that her bedroom door was closed. She had to open her door and her parents' door. But that's when police noticed something pretty significant. This is Sarah's bedroom. On the other end of the wall, there were these blood stains. Turns out it was blood and brain matter. When they tested it, it matched Diane. It was her mom's blood and brain matter on Sarah's bedroom wall. But I thought the door was closed. As a matter of fact, you can see her parents' bedroom and her bedroom has a perfect like line. And based on where Diane was sleeping in bed, which was here, her head would have been over here somewhere, it appeared the gunshot came from the other side of the bed and would have launched whatever kind of material towards Sarah's bedroom, which lined up with the autopsy that Diane was shot on the other side of her head and so it was impossible for Sarah's bedroom door to have been closed, as well as her parents. Outside in the trash, they found a pink robe. That robe did have some blood on it. And in that robe was a latex glove, a brown kind of work glove, some ammunition from a gun. And they wanted to pay attention to the latex glove. And they wanted to see if it had DNA inside. And it did. Given that the parents' blood was present on the robe, they figured whoever's DNA was in that glove was likely the shooter. There was DNA and it belonged to 16 year old Sarah Johnson. She likely wore the robe in order to prevent any blood from getting onto her. And she used Mel Spiegel's gun in order to possibly frame him for the murders. The police also found out that if both parents were dead, Sarah would inherit $600,000. It was a perfect motive. But Sarah also desperately wanted to be with Bruno Santos. Her parents wouldn't allow it, and so she needed her parents out of the way. Money and love. Those are two of the most classic motives you can think of. Unfortunately for her, Sarah was awful at committing this murder and hiding evidence. The moron left her mother's blood and brain matter on her bedroom wall. I mean... <laughs> her biological evidence found on the murder weapon, 
her DNA found inside the latex gloves, and I believe the other glove as well. They found no evidence to show that Bruno Santos had anything to do with the murder or that he even knew anything about it. As a matter of fact, when Sarah was arrested and go, went on trial, he would testify against her. Ah, young love. So Sarah goes on trial, and the evidence against her, which is not only circumstantial, but a ton of physical evidence, it's overwhelming. Sarah is found guilty of the murder of her parents, and she was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Womp. Womp. Ah, jump scare alert! Uh, sorry about that. What you are seeing is not a vampire. However, he is a cold-blooded killer. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Donna Kitowski. Viewer discretion is advised. Donna Maria Kitowski was born on July 7th, 1966. She was one of, I believe, two children. I know she was the only daughter and that she had at least one brother. When Donna was 18, she gave birth to her son, who she named Brad. And by the time this case occurred, Donna is 20 years old and her son is 18 months old and she absolutely loves her son. Donna lived in Las Vegas, Nevada, and I guess there was some kind of market or corner store somewhere close by to her house. So she told her parents that she was going to go walk down to the market to go get the ingredients she needed to bake Brad some cookies. But... Donna never got home. She would be reported missing later that evening. It would not take long to find her. It was the next afternoon and it was in the desert which was just next to the Nellis Air Force Base where the body of Donna Katowski was found. A piece of rebar was tied into her hair. Donna had been sexually assaulted. She was robbed of all the money she had on her. She was strangled. And then she was just thrown out in the desert where it was 115 degrees. However, Donna was still alive, but she was in essentially a coma. She was rushed to the nearest hospital where unfortunately two days later, she passed away. Around this same time, there were a couple of other robberies and assaults that occurred. And these were all in the same exact area where Donna had been likely taken from and then killed. They were able to discern or find out that the person committing these robberies was a man named Richard Haberstraw. They believed that he was responsible for what happened to Donna. It took them until, I think it was in 1986, when they finally found him all the way in New Jersey. He had been arrested for robbing and sexually assaulting women there. I guess they had enough evidence to show that he had committed the, the murder against Donna, and so he was extradited back to Las Vegas, where he would stand trial for her murder. He would actually end up as his own attorney. He tried to present at trial that because so there were, I guess, jailhouse snitches who had said that he had confessed to it. During his the trial, he said, who would be that stupid to tell that kind of stuff to an inmate? And also who would be that stupid to leave incriminating evidence at a murder scene? Because I guess there was incriminating evidence against him. There were witnesses who saw a suspicious man around the store where Donna likely was taken from, and those witnesses testified at trial that th that man was definitely Richard Haberstraw. So at this trial, he managed to actually persuade one juror, and there was a hung jury, and so there was a mistrial, and so he was ordered to go on a second trial. By the time his second trial would happen, DNA was, they were able to do a lot more with it than they were during his original trial. They were able to find DNA and prove that it was Richard Haberstraw's DNA at the crime scene. They also uncovered that Richard had given some jewelry to one of his family members, and when they tracked down that jewelry, it was confirmed to have belonged to Donna Katowski. So this time he is convicted and he is sentenced to death. Years later, when he is now an older vampire, apparently, uh, or a werewolf of some kind that hasn't changed all the way, unfortunately, he would try to appeal and he won the right to appeal that the death penalty was, I guess, they erred in giving him the death penalty based on some kind of prosecutorial misconduct. So he would get a new trial for that, but the jury would come back and say, no, nope, you're sentenced to death still. However, uh, in September of 2022, while still awaiting the actual death penalty, he died in his prison cell, I believe, of natural causes. Even though he looked like he had already been dead for about 20 years, finally, he will never, ever, ever be free. Her body was found thrown away in a box, and so the question became, 
who killed her. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Edna Posey. Viewer discretion is advised. It was May 27th, 1984. A fisherman who was walking along the Juniata River in Perry County, Pennsylvania, found a box. So he decided to look inside. Inside the box, he found a black trash bag. So he opened the bag up and he found a female's torso. Her head, her arms, and her legs were missing. And so obviously he then alerts the police. The woman had no identity on her. All they had was this belt buckle with some blue jeans. And she had some distinctive moles on her chest and back. But at first they had no idea who she was. And so eventually they bury her as a Jane Doe. A year after she is buried, a woman comes forward to state that one of her relatives is missing. The woman said her sister-in-law, 31-year-old Edna Posey, had gone missing over a year prior. The sister-in-law said she always wore this belt buckle with some blue jeans, and she had moles in the same place that the Jane Doe did. Now, the torso also had surgical scars on it from a previous surgery. And when they finally found out Edna Posey's name, they found out she had surgery and confirmed that those surgical scars matched hers. So they positively identified their victim as Edna Posey. Edna was a mother to this boy here, his name is Randy. A little over a year before her eventual murder, she had given custody of her son to a scout leader that she knew of. It was Randy's scout leader, a man named Donald Ruby. Edna had been going through a lot in her life. She had fallen into drugs and alcohol and she was walking life on the wild side. So she would check herself in to get help, and that's why she gave custody of her son to Mr. Ruby. Well, just a couple of days before her body was actually found, Edna Posey had reportedly gone to the Ruby household to pick her son up and take him back. Her son said that on that night, he was sleeping in his bedroom when all of a sudden he heard a very loud thump coming from the bedroom that his mom was sleeping in. But then he never saw her again. Now, initially, due to some insect uh, eggs and larva that was found on the box and on her body, the coroner had said that this victim, Edna, died that Friday night, which would line up with that loud thud that her son heard. So it must be uh, Donald Ruby who did it, right? So the box she was found in had this, I guess, a, to them, a very distinct puncture hole. It was also covered in a, a kind of like a grease. So they get a warrant to search Donald Ruby's car. In his trunk, they find grease that was pretty much the same grease found with the box. And the latch here, they said, matched the hole punctured in the box. However, that's purely circumstantial evidence. That is not anything physical that they can say for sure that he did this to her. This is when Donald says, well, he actually took Edna shopping on the morning of the 26th, which would have been that Saturday. And Donald Ruby's wife, Lee, would later tell police that she was with Donald and Edna when they went shopping, despite Donald saying he took her alone. But then he changed his story to say that his wife was with them. Then he said he left Edna at 1 p.m. and then he never saw her again. When being questioned by police, he said he thought that Edna had gone back to Florida where she had been receiving psych psychiatric care before. But based purely on circumstantial evidence and the fact that Donald Ruby was at times cons labeled as kind of a creep, Randy would say, uh, Edna's son would say, that Donald would wrestle Randy. And at times, Randy says he thinks that Mr. Ruby was sexually aroused when the two of them were wrestling. And according to Randy, Donald Ruby also wanted to take photos of uh, Randy while he was nude. And I guess he also took this child, Randy, to an adult bookstore. So with all of this, he is arrested and charged with the murder of Edna Posey. The motive they came up with was that he didn't want uh, Edna to take Randy back. He wanted Randy. So he must have killed Edna in order to continue having custody of the boy. At his trial, the prosecution also discovered that his wife lied about accompanying Edna and him at the clothing store that day. They found out that his wife was actually at work. She was clocked in and confirmed at work during the time he said he was there. She later admitted that she did lie and she did so to protect him because he, she didn't want him to get into any kind of trouble. So with all of this, he is found guilty of the murder and he's sentenced to life in prison. But then due to some evidentiary, I guess, issues, the, he was ordered a new trial. 
At the new trial, they actually would present new evidence, the defense would. You see, with Edna, in her, they actually found semen. Not just from one man, but from three different men. So they built up those three different profiles from three different men, and not one of those profiles matched Donald Ruby, meaning he did not have intercourse with her. However, it, they never really said if she was actually sexually assaulted or not. She did walk on the wild side, and she was kind of at times she would sleep with men, and so that may have nothing to do with her murder. But then new evidence was presented based on that same bug insect activity that she actually could not have been murdered that Friday night. She was murdered just shortly before she was found, during a period where Donald Ruby have, had an absolutely confirmed alibi. So with the DNA and his the newfound time of death, they find him not guilty of the murder, which means that the murder of Edna Posey is now unsolved. Jambalaya? Saturday, but Friday was a different story as videos show riders stuck on the Ferris wheel. Mm -mm. One rider, Randy Bro, was at the very bro? when the Ferris wheel started failing. <laughs> we didn't really think anything about it. Um, oh, fancy bro. Wheel. Maybe it's broken. You know, we're going to die. But anyway, it was kind of funny. <laughs> but it wasn't funny about five seconds later when it lurched forward and made this slamming sound. and Bussin'. We heard like metal creaking and, you know, just... It didn't sound good. According right. to event organizers, one of the tires that causes the wheel to spin was flat, causing the ride to spin. Tires? However, a Ferris wheel has tires? The WBRZ show that the structure had damage and the tires were under the rails. They can Workers go flat? had to stop the gondolas manually to get riders off of the Ferris wheel. One rider, Hannah Landry, made a bold decision to make sure that she was safe. But for others on the ride, jumping wasn't an option. Faith Roussard was on the ride with her young children when the Ferris wheel jolted and almost flung her daughter from the side. Thankfully, nobody was seriously injured in that Ferris wheel incident. But in 1922, an incident took place that was like one of my worst nightmares when it comes to Ferris wheels. I'm terrified of those things, by the way. This is another death set theme parks. Viewer discretion is advised. So this was a place called Clayson Point, which was near the Bronx, New York. It was like a like an amusement park type area, festival area. And this was the Ferris wheel there. Disaster struck this Ferris wheel on June 11th, 1922. It was a 100 foot tall Ferris wheel. And at the time this incident took place, it was being used, it was in operation and it was running. I don't know why, because there was a thunderstorm happening at the same time. There were 75 mile an hour winds. While the ride was literally in operation with people on it, the 75 to 80 mile an hour winds literally ripped the Ferris wheel from its base. It completely destroyed the support system keeping it up. And then the 100 foot Ferris wheel collapsed with people on it. There were people who were literally thrown from up top that fell 100 feet to the ground. The people who were lower, they really fell over, but then they were crushed by the seat they were in or the Ferris wheel structure itself. Then there were just people on the ground already who were struck by the falling debris or the Ferris wheel itself. And I guess it landed partially in the beach that was next to this. This says seven people were killed, but in the end, it was actually eight people who died that day. And at least 35 more people were seriously injured. Jesus Christ. I have always found Ferris wheels to be utterly terrifying because I'm petrified of them falling over. This wasn't the only time that's ever happened. Who does this one? This is another worst deaths imaginable. Viewer discretion is advised. It was July 29th, 2022 in a neighborhood in North Carolina. The people living inside this house were alarmed by a very loud thump or a sound coming from their backyard. When they go out to check to see what it was, they were absolutely horrified to find out. They had found the body of a 23-year-old co-pilot who had just fallen out of a plane. The plane in question had done an emergency landing shortly after this in this grassy field. While the plane in question was being flown that day to let skydivers jump out. And once everyone had jumped out, they were going to land the plane, but they had some kind of technical issue where the landing gear got damaged. So the plane goes back up and they're trying to find another way to land. The 23-year-old co-pilot apparently was shaken by this damage that occurred. And then he told the pilot he began to feel very sick. 
So the co-pilot gets out of his seat and he walks towards the back of the plane. This is when the plane is still at approximately 3,500 feet. This is a rough kind of estimate of that height. For whatever reason, they didn't close the, the back ramp that people had been jumping from. So it was still open when the co-pilot went back towards that area. The pilot ends up landing the plane in emergency fashion and when he goes to check, his co-pilot is missing. Well, sometime later that day, they found him in the backyard. They don't know if the man intentionally jumped or if he accidentally fell. But when he got to the back of that plane at 3,500 feet, he never grabbed hold of the metal railing that would have, you know, kept him from falling. Well, that's what they say or think. So he either accidentally fell or jumped himself out of the plane at 3,500 feet and fell to the earth below. 3,500 feet. He had no parachute. He had nothing. It was a complete free fall all the way to this backyard. And his landing was so loud that the people inside the house heard it. From some reports I've read in other situations like this, a person doesn't just simply die once they fall out of a plane and they begin to fall. There's always this notion that they might die of fear or fright, but you're falling at a very fast pace. And based on some reports that I've seen, people who this happens to, they're alive and alert as this is occurring. And they are likely alive and alert until they make contact with the ground. To me, that is like just, that's a whole new level of fear that I can't even possibly imagine. Just to know that you are there and you are falling and you see the ground coming up closer and closer and closer, that has to be horrifying to experience. Obviously the death itself, once you hit the ground, is instant, but for those few minutes, that is a nightmare. Is this guy a killer? Pro probably, probably. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Gwen Marie Story. Viewer discretion is advised. It was August 14th, 1979, here in Las Vegas, in this very, like, open field area, which is actually now this today. The body of a young woman was found. She had been beaten and stabbed to death. She was wearing this shirt. She also had on this jewelry. This was the initial sketch they made of the victim because she had no identification on her. When they put this sketch out there, some witnesses would come forward that like an hour or two hours or so before this body was found, witnesses saw that woman alive here at the corner of Las Vegas and Cincinnati at a now closed convenience store. That young woman was in the company of a man who looked like this. Guy's got hair for days. But even with this image out there, nobody knew him. Nobody knew if this was actually the killer. And quite honestly, they don't really know for 100% certainty if that was the same woman that was found dead. It took another 44 years to identify her. Thanks to Othram Labs, which specializes in genetic genealogy, they built the DNA profile and then using forensic genealogy, they found her family. Once they found relatives, they took DNA to compare. It was a match. The murder victim from 44 years prior was 19-year-old Gwen Marie Story. Gwen Marie Story, pictured here in several photos as a child, was actually originally from Cincinnati, Ohio. She vanished in 1979 when she got into a vehicle with two friends, and the point of this trip they were taking was to actually go to California to find Gwen's biological father. But she never made it there. The two friends ended up returning back to Cincinnati, Ohio shortly after all of this, like literally within the same couple of weeks that she was found dead. And they told her family that she decided to stay in Las Vegas, so we left her there. They don't know who the two friends are. Like the detectives don't have their names. They're kind of having to start from scratch to kind of build this case up. But they don't know if this man was one of her friends or this was someone totally different. Or was this guy not even related to this case whatsoever? So now they have to kind of work in Las Vegas, but also question people in Cincinnati. And they know she was murdered. It was a brutal murder. They just don't know who did this or why or when exactly did it happen. And so now the police in Las Vegas are asking for the public's help for any information. If you have information about the murder of Gwen Marie Story, please call 702-828-3521.
He said that the gun accidentally went off and that's how he was killed. Okay. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of James McGregor. Viewer discretion is advised. This case occurred here in the small town of Red Lodge, Montana. 63-year-old James Jimmy McGregor was an absolutely loved member of Red Lodge, Montana. Everyone there has nothing but fond memories of Jimmy McGregor. He was a farmhand. He did work at the local DY supply uh, hardware store. He was kind-hearted and generous. He was someone who would always help others that were in need. He was an excellent caretaker. He was just described by people as a super harmless guy, and he had a very warm nature to him. But on February 19th, 2018, Jimmy went missing. And that just really kind of confused this entire community. Because most people thought that something happened to him, like foul play, but no one could imagine who on earth would do that kind of thing to him. Two days later, near Bear Track Trailhead, which I guess was 12 miles away from Red Lodge, Jimmy's pickup truck was found abandoned. When police arrived, they noticed that there was a blood trail leading away from the truck. So they follow the blood trail and they find a body. And sadly, it was the body of 63-year-old James McGregor. He had a gunshot wound to his head. No gun was found. And so they knew immediately that this was a homicide. He must have been shot and killed somewhere else. And then his body was dragged to where it was found in the snow. The following day, they arrested this man here, T.J. Schifferns, for the murder of James McGregor. He originally told police that he knew nothing about the murder, but James McGregor had been living with him on again, off again, with him and T.J.'s girlfriend, Shiloh. But then he changes his tune almost immediately. T.J. alleges that he and James had gone to a fishing area near Bear Track Trailhead, Jimmy had started playing with this gun, a 357, and twirling it around. And TJ says, I want to try twirling it around. And then he says, as he was taking the gun from James, the gun accidentally goes off and it shoots James straight through his head. And then he decides to hide his body and run. You know, what an innocent person does. The gun was found several months later because TJ had thrown it into a nearby body of water. According to a friend of TJ's, her name was Kristen, TJ actually confessed to shooting and killing James. Purposefully, not on accident. This was because James was getting social security checks. James had received one just days before his killing. They also found out that TJ had once stole $1,500 from James. So the motive here was obviously financial. He ends up pleading guilty to deliberate homicide. He got life in prison with the chance of parole. For 48 years, she was known only as the Nation River Lady, but now she finally has a name and her killer has been caught. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Jewel Parchman Langford. Viewer discretion is advised. It was here in the Nation River in Ontario, Canada on May 3rd, 1975. The remains of a woman were found floating and it was determined quickly that she was murdered. The woman had been dressed in this top, and these were other items found with her remains. However, there was no identity. They did not know who she was. They came up with this initial composite drawing of the woman. They put her image out there, but no one could identify her. Later on, they would come up with this 3D mold of her, but again, no one could identify her. And her case goes cold for 48 years. In July of 2023, police in Ontario, Canada finally announced they know who she was. They were able to create a DNA profile by exhuming her remains and running it through familial DNA, genealogical DNA, all of that good stuff that we see a lot of now these days. She was identified as 48-year-old Jewel Parchman Langford. Jewel was born on March 30th, 1927. She at one point was married, but they had divorced by the time she, by the time all this happened. Jewel was a resident of Tennessee. She owned her own business and she had gone to Ontario uh, on vacation. When her family hadn't heard from her and she never came back to Tennessee, they would actually report her missing to the police in Ontario. However, they never pieced together that the body they found may have been her. But they did question a person that she had been known to be staying with, a man named Rodney Nichols. He basically said he just assumed she picked up and left and that's where she was and he didn't know. 
And so when they finally identified her in 2023, now they piece together that this missing person report was the same body in this river. But again, they never pieced it together. And now through re-interviewing witnesses, they found Rodney Nichols living in Florida. In 2023, he is now 81 years old. He is battling dementia and other medical issues. Apparently, he confessed to the murder. However, his lawyers are now trying to state that his dementia and all these other medical issues, he doesn't know what he's talking about. But he was the last one to ever see uh, Jewel in Canada. So... He was arrested in Florida for the murder of Jewel. It took a few months, but they finally had to go through some legal loopholes. They were trying to say, oh, he's too old and he's too sick to be extradited. They said, nah, F that. And now he's finally in Canada where he has been charged with the murder. However, the case is still ongoing. A trial has not occurred, but hopefully soon she gets justice. A prominent couple is presumed dead and their alleged killer, well, he's dead too. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of John and Elizabeth Calvert. Viewer discretion is advised. John and Elizabeth lived here part-time at Hilton Head Island in South Carolina. They were a very wealthy and successful couple. They ran several businesses together. Elizabeth was also a lawyer in Savannah, Georgia, where they had another home. And I believe they actually lived here on a yacht on the island. They were a very well-respected couple. They were known to a lot of people, and a lot of people had nothing but nice things to say about them. They seemed to be good, honest, hard-working individuals. Throughout their business dealings, they did a lot of work with this man here, Dennis Gerwing. But towards the end of this business relationship, the Calverts wanted to sever ties with him. This is because they found out or they believed that Gerwing was embezzling millions of dollars from their accounts, which would later be found out to be true. He had embezzled over like two, $2.5 million from them. So John and Elizabeth had arranged to meet with Dennis on March 3rd, 2008. They left for the meeting and then never seen again. They were reported missing the following day by a family member of Elizabeth's when they hadn't been able to get a hold of them. And that's when police discovered that their last known meeting was with this individual, Dennis Gerwing. So they question him and he says, yeah, we had our meeting. It was around 5.30 p.m. And after that meeting, they left to go have dinner and I went my separate way. Well, doing some digging, they found out that Mr. Gerwing, just hours before this meeting was supposed to happen, he went out and purchased these like really large drop cloths, something that his business partner said he had no reason to buy. And then very shortly after this scheduled meeting with the Calverts, a witness said they saw a very fresh wound on Dennis's hand. When police looked at this wound, they said it was a slide bite wound. When a semi-automatic weapon, when it travels, I guess, back and forth during the discharge. They searched his home and they found a holster, but no gun. They searched the Calvert's yacht, but did not get much evidence from it. And the couple was just now nowhere to be found. No one had seen them ever again. No one had heard from them. Their bank accounts were never used again. Social security numbers never used again. And they announced that their prime suspect was Dennis Gerwing. They announced that on March 11, 2008. That same day, Dennis Gerwing ended his own life. He left two suicide notes, admitting to embezzling millions of dollars from the Calverts and other people, but not admitting to murdering them. The couple is presumed dead. With their suspect dead, they may never find them. Was the ghost of a murder victim haunting his old home? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of John Harden. Viewer discretion is advised. In 1978, this woman here, June Ferris, and her family moved into a home in Claremont, Florida. Now, June says that years prior, she was having dreams about this house that she had never been in. And then one day, she's driving around town, and she sees a for sale sign for this house here in Claremont, Florida. She calls the realtor, and the realtor gives her a walkthrough of the home, and June realizes, this is the house I've been dreaming of for years. And her and her family eventually move into it. Well, almost immediately, they begin to see things and hear things. Music playing in the basement. The apparition of a man standing over their bed. 
And so eventually, um, a family member of June's does some digging into the house. And they find out that back in 1975, a murder took place just outside the house. 32-year-old John Harden, he grew up in South Florida. He at one point married his high school sweetheart, Rita. They actually had four kids together. But one day out of nowhere, John approaches Rita and says, I have to go away for a while. She has no idea why he did this. But within a year, he actually ends up remarrying someone. And he and his new wife move into this old Victorian home. Well, anyway, June Ferris and her family, the ones who actually have seen this apparition in their home, say, oh my god, it looks just like John. So what happened to him? On March 22, 1975, John and his new wife were asleep in their bed when all of a sudden John was awoken to the smell of smoke and he sees flames coming from outside. He realizes his pickup truck is on fire. So he races out, gets a fire extinguisher and begins to put the fire out. When all of a sudden, someone approaches him with a 20 gauge shotgun and shoots him point blank range. And the killer flees the scene. John is pronounced dead less than an hour later. Police in Florida, they began to investigate this case. They traveled all around Florida. They interviewed hundreds upon hundreds of people. They explored every lead they could explore. They questioned his ex-wife and the whole scenario about what happened there, but they got nothing. They got no new information that would help them find out who did this and why. John apparently had no enemies in this new area where he lived. And so this became an incredibly difficult case to investigate. They did discover that the truck was deliberately set on fire. This was an arson. And it was clear to police that whoever set the car on fire did it on purpose with the intent of luring John out. His phone lines had also been cut so that no one could call 911. But who killed John Harden and why? If you have information, call 352-394-5588. Well, someone's throwing a temper tantrum. Maybe he needs his binky. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of John Paul Phillips. Viewer discretion is advised. How sad that this is the only remaining photo I can find of this man. This case occurred between 1975 and 1981 here in Carbondale, Illinois. On November 11th, 1981, the nude body of Joan Weatherall was found in a nearby body of water closer to Elkville, Illinois. She had been sexually assaulted, she had been bludgeoned over her head, and was strangled to death. Joan was last seen at a bar the night prior on November 10th. But the investigation into her murder pretty much stalled right away. They just didn't have anything. And... <laughs> And then, in 1984, John Paul Phillips was in prison serving a five-year sentence for something completely different when he confessed to a cellmate that he was the one to have killed Joan Weatherall. He told this cellmate that he had committed a bunch of crimes, including two other murders. So police got this confession from the cellmate and they looked into this. They discovered that John Paul Phillips was at the same bar the same night that Joan Weatherall was last seen alive. He also provided information that nobody else would have known unless he was the one to have killed her. So he was promptly charged with her murder. He would end up being convicted of her murder and sentenced to death. But in 1993, he died in prison. I'm not sure exactly how. He sure left a lasting impression, huh? He was a very troubled guy growing up. He had a lot of issues, but apparently didn't really get much help for those issues and it led him to a life of being a criminal. But what about the two other murders he had confessed to while in prison? Well, it wouldn't be actually until 2008 when they were able to finally prove he committed them. They would exhume his body, they took uh, his femur bone, which I guess they got DNA from, and they compared it to fingernail scrapings found underneath the nails of another murder victim. And it also helped link to a second murder victim using DNA. The victims were 22-year-old Teresa Clark. She had been found murdered in 1975. And then the DNA also matched the murder, the 1976 murder of 24-year-old Kathleen McSherry, who was found brutally killed inside her apartment. Teresa Clark was also found the same way in her apartment. All of these murders occurred in the same area, general area of Carbondale, Illinois. So they confirmed without a shadow of a doubt that John Phillips was responsible for all three murders. But unfortunately, the other two women will never get their justice because he died in prison before that could ever happen. 
It is entirely possible that John Paul Phillips killed more women or sexually assaulted at least more women, and maybe one day we'll find out more. But until then, he is rotting in hell, exactly where he should be. This is the viral TikTok shop shoelace that's now finally back in stock. Now that I might have your attention, hello, true crimers. This is the case of Joseph John Cannon. Viewer discretion is advised. I don't have a lot of backstory on this one, and sadly, I do not have a confirmed photo of the victim. At the time of this case, Joseph John Cannon was just 17 years old, and from what I can see, he spent most of his young life in and out of jail or juvenile hall. He was constantly getting into trouble for things like burglary and petty crimes like that. So in 1977, he racked up a burglary and habitation charge, and he was represented by an attorney named Dan Carabin. Dan and his sister Ann Walsh lived here on Babcock Road in San Antonio, Texas. It doesn't look like the house is actually there anymore. But Dan allowed Joseph to stay at the house with them while he was awaiting his court appearances. Dan and, and his sister Ann were being good Samaritans and giving Joseph a roof over his head. Ann Walsh was a mother to eight children, and she herself was also an attorney, very well respected in the community. Well, on September 30th, 1977, after Joseph had been staying with them for about a week or so, Ann comes home on her lunch break, where she is suddenly accosted by Joseph Cannon. He's carrying a 22 caliber weapon that he stole from the house and he shot her with it. He shot her eight times. He then tried to sexually assault her after she was dead. Then he stole a vehicle from the home and he took off. And he also stole some guns, but thankfully he was found, he was pulled over in the stolen vehicle after the body was found and he was promptly arrested. Joseph said that while he was at the home that day, he said he found a bunch of guns and then he just suddenly went crazy. He said he was drunk and he was high on drugs. He didn't know what he was doing, but he just, he just killed her and tried to rape her. So the 17 year old goes on trial and he is found guilty of capital murder. And at age 17, he is sentenced to death by lethal injection. His attorneys did try to argue that he was a minor at the time of this murder, and so he should be given some kind of leniency, plus the fact that he was, you know, intoxicated and had other things in his system. But again, he chose to put those things in his body, knowing full well th what happens when you're high and also drunk. The courts denied any appeal he had for leniency to get a lesser sentence. In 1998, he was executed by lethal injection. He said in his final words that he was sorry to the family and that he couldn't forgive himself if he were them for what he did. The first attempt failed, and by the second attempt, he was pronounced dead. His burned out vehicle was found shortly after he left work. What happened to Kevin? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Kevin Price. Viewer discretion is advised. This particular case happened in Somerset, Kentucky. Kevin Price lived in that area and he was 21 years old at the time of this case. Kevin worked at a place called Eagle Hardwood there in Somerset. On November 9th, 2009, he left his job at approximately 3.30 p.m. This is in the middle of the day. It's broad daylight out. He never gets home. His family would end up calling police to report him missing later that evening because this was highly unusual for him to just not show up back at home and nobody can get a hold of him. Well, later that evening, somewhere kind of behind where he actually worked, his silver Dodge Dakota, a pickup truck, had been found and it was completely burnt out. Kevin was nowhere to be found. And it doesn't really sound like they were able to get much evidence from the truck, obviously because of the fire would have destroyed most of it. Roughly a month or so goes by in Eastern Pulaski County, in this very rural area, in this like foresty type path, there is a burn pit. The people who found this burn pit noticed that there were human or skeletal remains inside of it. Those remains would be taken back to the coroner and I believe they would likely use dental records to confirm that the body in that burn pit was that of 21 year old Kevin Price. They have not released his actual cause of death, but they have said that this is obviously a homicide. We're now somewhere around, what, 14 or so years later, 
and they have no suspects. I, I think at one point they had like persons of interest that they looked into, but there was never any evidence to say that these people had done anything, and this case remains unsolved. By all accounts, it, it appeared he was a normal, happy guy, didn't really have any enemies that they knew of. I'm sure they've looked into his co-workers, considering his burned out vehicle was found behind where he worked. If they have any evidence on them, it's not enough to arrest anyone. It really just sounds like they have nothing and they, they need the public's help to help solve this because somebody somewhere out there has to know the truth. And perhaps that someone is you. This case isn't that old. The killer is definitely still out there. I mean, assuming they're still alive, but killers, they love to talk and surely they've spoken to someone. And maybe you're afraid of that person going against you somehow, some way. You can always report your information anonymously. You don't have to say who you are at all. You just have to say what you know. Kevin and his family deserve their day in court. They deserve justice for Kevin. Kevin was murdered. I mean, plain and simple. Someone either took him from his work or someone lured him out to that area and then returned his truck to burn it. I don't know, but someone did something to him and killed him. What the motive is, I don't think they've said what the motive is or what they think it is. If you have any information on the murder of Kevin Price, please contact the Pulaski County Sheriff's Department at 606-678-5145. If you know anything, please provide that information to police and help Kevin get the justice he rightfully deserves. Did a man actually stumble upon a kidnapped woman in the middle of the forest? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Kimberly Pandelios. Viewer discretion is advised. 24-year-old Kimberly Pandelios had immigrated to the United States from Cuba with her parents when she was a child. Eventually, her family would settle down in Pennsylvania. Later on, when she was an adult, she would end up getting married, and her, her husband, and their uh, young baby would end up moving to California. And she was aspiring to become a model as well. On the night of February 28, 1992, a vehicle was found on the side of the road, and it had been completely burnt out. The vehicle was found next to the Angeles Forest. It was more than obvious that the car, that this was an arson. Someone had started the fire on the passenger side of the vehicle in order to dispose of any evidence. And once they ran the plates, they found out and linked it to Kimberly Pandelios, who had been reported missing, I think the day prior by her husband. That day, the day she would have disappeared, she had dropped off her child at the babysitter the babysitter would later tell police that Kimberly said she had made a phone call with a man named Paul who was, wanted her to come out to do some like outdoor shoot and that she was going to be on her way to meet that man. Well, Kimberly never came home that day and so she was reported missing. On February 29th, 1992, this was I guess a leap year, a man who they called Jeff was driving, I guess, his little beat up car through the Angeles forest because there's a lot of roads to do some off-roading on. He stumbled across this side road he had never been down before, so he decided to turn down it. He got to a point where he saw this like really old van parked and then he saw a tent or two. There was a fire pit in the middle of this campground and sitting right next to that fire was a young, blonde, beautiful woman who was just sitting there staring right back at Jeff. She didn't say anything, she didn't make any noises, she didn't do anything. Her hands were behind her back, according to Jeff. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary until these three men who Unsolved Mysteries depicts as like these hills have eyes, hillbilly type people. They, they all run towards Jeff's car and like sm smack on his car and tell him to get the hell out of here. And so Jeff's like, okay, I'm taking off. And so he just leaves. The case pretty much goes cold until March of 1993. Two hikers, they are, they're hiking along inside the Angeles Forest campgrounds and they stumble across some skeletal remains of a human. They notify police through some dental records and whatnot. They're able to identify those remains as Kimberly Pandelios. This was uh, evidence to them that it was a homicide. Jeff takes police to this campground where he had seen, you know, what he who he thought was Kimberly, possibly with her hands bound behind her back. And he did this, by the way, just a couple of days after she's reported missing, not not when she was found uh, deceased. But when they got to that campsite, there was nothing. There was no evidence. It had rained. There, it, there was just nothing there. It wouldn't be until 2004 when police finally found out who her killer was. 
through what they say is a series of tracing phone calls back to certain numbers that may have called Kimberly. And they interviewed several witnesses who were females who had been attacked by a particular man. They were able to identify Kimberly's killer as a man named David Rademaker or Rademaker. They came to the conclusion that he, in fact, was this Paul person who had called to schedule an outdoor shoot with Kimberly. Phone records indicated that he had called her phone just literally like hours before she left and then eventually disappeared. David had told a girlfriend of his, if you don't cooperate with me and do what I want, I'm going to do what I did to that Kimberly Pandelios girl in the forest. He indicated to the girlfriend that he drowned her in a river. Another girlfriend would claim that he basically threatened to kill her as well and mentioned Kimberly. Then another girlfriend would come forward to police. This is years later because obviously these women were terrified of this man. Another girlfriend would come forward to state that she was in fact there when David burned out the vehicle, Kimberly's vehicle. None of these accounts, none of these stories at all indicated that there were other men involved and that the woman that this Jeff person saw in the forest that day was not Kimberly, could not have been. The timing was right, but there was only one man involved. None of them looked like David. Who that woman was and why it was such a weird situation, I don't think they know. At his trial, David would admit that he was the one who burned out Kimberly's car, but he said he just found it there, that he did not kill Kimberly. The jury didn't buy it, and he was convicted of her murder, and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Did Larry Hall actually kill her, or was it yet another false confession? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Lori Deppis. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Lori Deppis was just 20 years old and she was living in the Fox Valley community in Wisconsin. On the night of August 19th, 1992, at approximately 10 p.m., she was seen leaving her job here at the Fox River Mall. Then she drove to her boyfriend's apartment and this is confirmed that she made it there because here in this photo you can see right here is the middle is her car and it was parked right by his apartment. However, Lori never made it inside. Lori has never been seen again. The last time anyone actually can confirm physically seeing her is at work, leaving work, and this is exactly what she was dressed in that day. When the boyfriend realized that she hadn't come inside yet, he goes out there to check and finds her car, and there is this coffee cup on top of the car. This is exactly how the car was found. There was no sign of a struggle in the car or outside the car, and nobody can recall hearing or seeing anything like an altercation, an argument, nothing. Lori was just there and then she was gone and gone forever. No sign of her, no article of evidence, no clothing, nothing has ever been found. There was virtually no evidence to work with. I mean, they took the car in and they've kept it ever since. On the coffee cup, was a fingerprint. This is a photo of that print. I believe it was confirmed to not match her boyfriend. However, I don't think they can compare it to obviously Lori because they don't have Lori. But I don't know if they've gotten other items they know she's touched and like maybe compared it to this. I'm not sure. Or if this fingerprint is of the person who may have abducted her. But Lori's case goes cold very, very quickly. There wouldn't be any movement in this case until 2011. That is when this man here, Larry Hall, a convicted murderer, confessed to murdering Lori Deppis. He said he met her at the mall, then followed her home or to the boyfriend's apartment and then abducted her. He used chloroform to do it. He then killed her and then disposed of her body. Police announced this lead to the press, but at the time they said we were trying to corroborate his story, find anything that can say he's telling the truth. But they never found that evidence. They searched areas. I know they've dug up areas. I'm guessing where Larry Hall said he may have put her, but they've never found her or any sign of her at all. Larry Hall had falsely confessed before to other murders, so this isn't unusual. However, police can place him in that area just the week prior to the disappearance. But like I said, that was way back in 2011. It's 2024 now, and they've never been able to confirm anything he has said. It does sound like they still kind of believe him, 
but without that evidence, they can't charge him. And especially without a body, they can't even confirm that she is in fact deceased, despite them pretty much feeling that she is dead. They do believe that without a shadow of a doubt, she was abducted from that parking lot, possibly for the reason of sexual assault and then murdered and then dumped somewhere. But was it him or somebody completely different? Nobody knows. Lori Deppis is still out there somewhere. She may be in a shallow grave somewhere in an open field or in a forest. She has not been properly laid to rest and she deserves to be. So if you have any information about the disappearance and whereabouts of Lori Deppis, please call 920-751-4180. This is a bad lady. Bad lady. Very bad. Hello, true crimers and this smug little son of a bitch. This is the case of Lena Regina Smith. Viewer discretion is advised. This case happened in the neighborhood of Roxbury, which is in Boston, Massachusetts. And unfortunately, I don't have a photo of the victim. But this happened on July 25th, 1970. A 24-year-old sex worker named Lena Regina Smith was servicing one of her clients, a man named Walter Shiz, C-H-I-Z-E. He was 33 years old. Well, they were at his apartment when for whatever reason, I can't really find the true motive here. There's very little published about this case. Lena takes a knife and she stabs Walter several times until he is dead. She went around Roxbury after this and was bragging to people about having committed this murder. And she seemed almost thrilled about it by what it sounds like. But then Lena, she fled town and she would be arrested almost a little over a year later. She was arrested on August 18th, 1971, and then she was charged with the murder. All I can really see, though, at this point is that she ended up taking a plea deal. She would plead guilty to manslaughter, and she was only sentenced to 8 to 15 years. That's it. But then on August 27th, 1976, Lena, along with another inmate, using a bedsheet, managed to scale a wall of the prison, and they escaped. Lena's cohort was apparently arrested within a few days of the escape, but Lena remained on the run. For the next 17 years, they were searching and searching all over the country for her, but they finally got a tip from Commerce City, Colorado. A woman had been arrested because she was selling stolen vacuums. And I guess when they were looking through photos of wanted fugitives, they found a photo of Lena and it matched the person they had arrested in Colorado. She tried to say it wasn't her, she was somebody else. And in this, they actually found out her real name was Valerie Osborne. They wanted to make sure that it was her, so they took her fingerprints from her arrest in Massachusetts, compared them to the fingerprints of the woman in Colorado, and it was her. So Lena was brought back to Massachusetts and was put back in the exact same prison she escaped from 17 years prior. And I can only really assume that she finished her actual sentence and was likely released at some point, but there is very, very little information about her case. But she had also committed a series of other crimes before the murder and uh, shortly after the murder and obviously years later. She was just, she had a laundry list of, of crimes, mainly like petty crimes. But at least she didn't kill anyone else, so I guess that's a plus. You're a bad, bad lady, ma'am. Mm -mm. A young woman was killed because of a couple of comments she made while watching a movie. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Lola Martinez. Viewer discretion is advised. April 18th, 2008, at the Indiana University, Purdue University, Fort Wayne, and this is at the dorms. At 11.53 in the morning, you can see on CCTV a young woman running from her apartment. She goes to a neighbor to have them call 911. She just found her roommate brutally murdered inside. That roommate was 22-year-old Lola Martinez, who was originally from New Mexico, but was studying graphic design there at Purdue University. She lived in the dorm with three roommates. By all accounts, they all got along really, really well. They liked each other. Lola was a really happy-go-lucky type person. She never caused any issues. So what would lead to this? There was blood on the walls, blood all over the kitchen. They found the knife that was used to stab her. It had been bent at a 90 degree angle and the handle had broke off. There was also a hot pan on the ground that clearly was holding water at one point. 
while Lola had burns to her body that would indicate that someone, her killer, threw a pot of boiling water on her and then stabbed her repeatedly. So police obviously has to question the roommates. The roommate who found her body was Shasta Myers. They checked CCTV and they found that Shasta had left earlier that day and never came back until she found the body. So they knew she did not do this. Another roommate named Mandy was actually out of town and so they confirmed that she could not have done this either. And then the third roommate was named Tanzania. Well, it turns out that Tanzania's mom, Tina Lorraine Morris, had been staying at the dorm apartment with them for several days. According to Shasta and Tanzania, Tanzania, her mom Tina, and Lola had been watching a movie the night prior. Apparently, Tanzania had been asking a whole bunch of questions and talking throughout the movie, and so at one point, Lola makes a couple of comments to her. You know, comments along the lines of, hey, maybe let's just watch the movie. But there wasn't any, like, physical altercations or any kind of fight that happened or anything. Police also question Lola's boyfriend. He worked at a restaurant that I guess she also worked at, but he was incredibly cooperative with police. He actually approached police before they approached him, and they were able to rule him out. So they go back to the CCTV. They once again see Shasta leaving that morning and they also see Tanzania le leaving that morning. They don't see Tina leaving the apartment though. At one point they do see Tina leaving, but then she comes back and she's in the apartment for roughly an hour or so. And when she comes out, she's in different clothing and she's concealing her left hand in a pocket. They then observe her looking around as she's waiting for the elevator. And then an hour or so later is when the roommate finds Lola's body. But now they can't find Tina. They question Tanzania and she says she hasn't heard from her mom. As a matter of fact, Tanzania hasn't seen her mom or heard from her mom since the body of Lola was found. Tanzania thought that was a little strange. She remembered hearing her mom say at one point she was going to be going to Miami soon, but she didn't know if she was there or not. They also questioned the other roommates with regards to Tina being there and apparently Tina was overstaying her welcome to all of them. And so they are now beginning to think that Tina is Lola's killer. Well, Lola's car is also missing, so they put out an APB for the car and also for Tina. Well, a few days later, Tina calls police and says that she is now in Indianapolis. She had actually called her daughter Tanzania, and Tanzania basically begged her and convinced her to please turn yourself in. So police in Indianapolis find Tina. They also find the stolen car, and she is arrested without incident. She initially tells police that after everyone left the apartment, it was just her and Lola that morning. Tina was mad at Lola because Lola made some what she considered rude comments to her daughter, Tanzania, during the movie they were watching, even though the comments didn't bother Tanzania at all. But she felt that she disrespected her daughter. So she had a fight with, with Lola about this the following morning. Initially, she says Lola started to attack her first. Then police are like, we don't believe that. And then Tina said, okay, I lied. I started it. And so she was arrested and charged with murder and grand theft auto. She initially tried to plead guilt, not guilty by reason of insanity, but eventually she took that off the table, or her lawyers did. And she just flat out pled guilty to murder. And in agreement, they would take away the other uh, charges. So Tina was sentenced to 60 years in prison for the murder of Lola Martinez all because of a couple of comments that Lola made to her daughter. Unbelievable. The murder of a young girl inside of a subway station in 1975 is still unsolved. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Marion Peters. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Marion Peters was just 16 years old, and she lived with her family in Toronto, Canada. She was one of three kids, and their parents were actually both survivors of the Holocaust. Their names were Max and Merle Peters. On November 7, 1975, Mary and Peters would leave their home with her mom, and she was supposed to be going to visit her grandfather in the hospital. So her mom dropped her off at Finch Station, and then she would arrive here at St. Patrick Station. Now, at one point, St. Patrick Station had corridors that would go from the northbound and southbound terminals. They were fairly dark hallways, basically, and Miriam would be walking down one of those corridors. When, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, some stranger comes out of the shadows and just stabs the 16-year-old girl. Not once, not twice, but 16 
times. An absolutely brutal attack. It was quick and no one heard or saw a thing. Not one single person saw her attacker. She would be found and then rushed to a hospital where a couple of hours later she was sadly pronounced dead. Apparently within 10 minutes of her attack, another woman was also stabbed multiple times. And this was just a few minutes away from St. Patrick's Station. Police said they had a person of interest in Miriam's case and this other woman's case. However, they've never pressed charges or even arrested anyone because they lack any kind of evidence. And I'm guessing, I mean, this is 1975, so physical evidence was a different thing back then. You know, there's going to be things that they didn't really know they had to collect or had to store in a certain way because DNA testing wasn't even a thing yet. They would offer a $10,000 reward for any information that would help lead to the capture of her killer, but they got nothing. The attacks would later prompt there to be a higher police and security presence at subway stations. They installed like uh, passenger activated alarm systems. They put mirrors in the subway cars and they ended up walling off these passageways here at this particular location and the location where the other woman was stabbed. I don't know her name and I don't know if she survived or not, but to my understanding, these sections are actually still walled off. I think some of them were converted into like storage areas too. If you have information about the murder of Miriam Peters, please contact the RCMP in Toronto, Canada. He was shot and killed outside of a bar and they still have not charged anyone. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Matthew Groves. Viewer discretion is advised. It was approximately 4.30 a.m. on July 21st, 2018, here in Phoenix, Arizona, where I'm actually at. Police were called because there was a shooting outside of a bar. The bar is called the Purple Turtle, and it's located on 51st Avenue and Indian School. When they arrived, they found 26-year-old Matthew Groves, pictured here with his mom, and he was on the ground and he had been shot. Matthew was rushed to the hospital, but just a few hours later, sadly, he would be pronounced deceased. Matthew was wearing a backpack that evening, and the backpack was missing. According to witnesses, he was riding his skateboard around that area. I'm not sure if he was actually at the bar that night or just passing by it, but he was confronted by someone, his eventual killer, uh, right outside that bar. They don't know if the killer was like, I want to steal your backpack, so I shot you, or it was, oh, I shot him, now let me see what's in his backpack, kind of thing. They don't know what the motive was, but the backpack has never been found. According to the family, from what I can see, they don't really feel like the Phoenix police are doing much about this. They are trying to put pressure on the Phoenix police, but his mom actually would say that the, the Phoenix police are being lazy about this. It was actually one of Matthew's friends that did some of the investigation the himself, and he came across information about a particular man. That man is 24-year-old Antonio Ibarra. The friend of Matthew found out that Antonio had been bragging to people in Phoenix that he had stolen a backpack from someone and shot that person. Matthew's friend found out the guy's name and then he tracked him down. When he went to this guy's house, he saw a mountain bike just parked right outside his home. Well, uh, apparently according to CCTV and police have confirmed this, a man on a mountain bike had passed by that exact same area pretty much the exact same time that Matthew was killed. The person on the bike is actually later seen with the backpack on him and riding away from the murder scene. But the, the footage of the bike apparently isn't good enough to confirm if the bike outside his house is the same one. However, he actually would end up admitting that he stole the backpack, but he said he did not shoot Matthew. So he was arrested briefly, but then he was released because police did not have any forensic evidence to connect him to the crime. And ever since then, nothing has been done, nothing has happened. Matthew Grove's murder is technically unsolved, but it sure seems like one particular person did this. But if you have information, please call 480-948-6377. He was last seen walking away from a party and has never been seen since.
Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Michael Bryson. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Michael Bryson was 27 years old and he was living in Oregon. His parents described him as someone with a giant heart. He was always looking out for other people. Michael would actually go on mission trips to places like Africa. And every time he came back from those mission trips, he always told his parents, I just need to move there so I can continue helping. Michael did have a bit of an issue with uh, drugs and alcohol. He was, at this point, trying to get better. Just before the COVID pandemic hit, he started a job at a local bar and grill there in Oregon. And he fully intended to go to school to become an electrician. That was his goal. But ultimately, his passion was music. He loved playing music. He also was a fantastic DJ. He would DJ at parties and raves and stuff like that. Michael was last seen by his parents on August 3rd, 2020. He told them that he was going to be going to the Umqua National Forest, specifically to the Hobo Campground, where there was going to be a week-long party, birthday party for a friend. And by all accounts, Michael was observed the first two days there. He seemed to be in good spirits. He even DJed one night. But then in the early morning hours of August 5th, 2020, he was observed walking away from the campground and he was never seen again. So the campground was near Dorena, Oregon, and then this is exactly where he was last seen. And so when he was finally reported missing by his parents, police would go out there, they would do a very detailed grid search of the entire area, the entire park, and they didn't find him at all. No signs of him, no traces, nothing. Police began to wonder were the people at this party, there was about 40 to 60 people there, were they telling the truth about the last time he was seen? Or were they covering for something? Because it's unusual to not find him if he were to have accidentally, you know, fallen somewhere. But nobody seemed to be cooperating fully. But they also didn't have any evidence or anything like that to suggest that any of them did anything to him. They brought in search dogs. They used drones. They were searching on foot, on horseback. And it wouldn't be until December of 2020 when they found some evidence. They found like some of his belongings near, I think, a body of water there in the forest. But no signs of foul play, no blood or anything like that. These are all of the tattoos that Michael has. And police want people to make note of them just in case they recognize him if they ever find someone. At the time, he was six foot tall, approximately 180 pounds. There is a $10,000 reward for information that helps lead to the answers. If you know those answers, call 541-682-4150. Imagine falling in an elevator from something as high as the top of this building. This is another worst freak accidents viewer discretion is advised. The story occurred at the Val Reefs North Gold Mine, which is located in South Africa. Operating in this mine shaft was something similar to this type of train. The one in this story was a 12-ton locomotive, and it's supposed to operate down paths kind of like this. But on May 10th, 1995, at approximately 8.30 p.m., that train entered a tunnel more like this. It took a wrong turn. It crashed through a safety barrier, and it just basically went crazy from here. The train, now wildly out of control, falls down into the number two mine shaft. Unfortunately, at this exact same time, 104 miners got onto the elevator on the 62nd level, and it was beginning to ascend. The train, it continued to plummet down this mine shaft where the elevator was going up. It then crashed into the top of the elevator with 104 people on it. At this point, the elevator was at a roughly 1,500 to 1,600 feet up. And the safety mechanism, which was like a hook bar, uh, was completely destroyed once the train hit it, causing the elevator to then collapse at a high speed at 1,500 feet. To give you some perspective here, it is somewhere around like the height of the top of this building all the way to the bottom. Once the elevator made contact with the ground, the 104 men aboard it were killed instantly. But for at least a few moments, they were living in an absolute nightmare, pure hell, as that elevator collapsed. They said that they literally, the bodies essentially just exploded. There were body parts just 
everywhere and they have they've still never have found all of the body parts they said skin there was like skin just like caked all over the walls most of the victims you couldn't even tell who any of them actually were at this point because they were just crushed they said that the elevator basically had been crushed into a small tin box I think in the end they were able to recover 56 bodies completely, but the rest was just, they were just so badly mangled in, in such in so many pieces that it was so difficult to and they would hold a mass funeral for 45 of those victims. I know in the end the mining company ended up or the shareholders ended up compensating the victims' families. And it doesn't sound like the driver of the locomotive who did not die, he actually managed to jump out of the locomotive before it actually fell. Doesn't sound like he was held responsible because other safety precautions completely failed. This is like one of the worst ones I've ever heard about, ever. She was seen leaving this grocery store and then never again. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Nancy Renkis. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Nancy Rankis was living in Florence, Wisconsin. But in July of 2016, she would go visit Iron Mountain, Michigan. She was there to go see, allegedly, a relative, and was also there, allegedly, to look at a camper trailer that she may want to purchase. On July 18th, 2016, the 47-year-old woman was seen shopping at the Super One Foods grocery store in Iron Mountain, Michigan. She's then seen getting into a white SUV in the parking lot of the Super One store and the vehicle leaves and then Nancy is never seen again. Nancy would very soon be reported missing. Nancy was last seen wearing a dark blue t-shirt with dark blue jeans. Due to a medical issue, Nancy walks with a limp and she also has an L-shaped scar on her left hand. Now, the next part of this is really just me saying this is allegedly, and this is according to what police have released publicly. But I am by no means accusing any person of committing any kind of crime here. Just reiterating, again, what police have released publicly. This is a person of interest in this case. This is Nancy's sister-in-law, Louise Wender. Louise just so happens to work at the Super One Foods that Nancy was last seen at. Louise also drives a white SUV, pretty much the same vehicle that Nancy was seen getting into and then never seen again. And then on video on CCTV, the last person confirmed to be in the presence of Nancy on video was Louise. Police have found said vehicle, and I know they processed it or are still in the process of looking through it. I'm not 100% sure, but it needs to be noted that Louise Wender has never been charged with anything connected to this case. She was listed as a suspect at one point, but it is now about eight or so years later, and she has never been charged. So it sounds like they don't have any actual evidence to show that she actually did anything. Just that she was the last person seen with the disappeared woman. Police have stated publicly, though, that they are investigating this as a homicide. As of right now, it's a no-body homicide. They have never found Nancy or any trace of her. If there is any kind of motive that they're aware of, they have not released that publicly either. But foul play is absolutely believed to be involved in this case. I don't know if they've questioned the person she was supposed to be seeing about the camper. I'm not sure. If you have any information, please call 906-774-6262. Both her head and her killer have never been found. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the Orchard Apartment murders. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured here was 33-year-old Alice Elaine Rankin, and she lived in Houston, Texas. On July 27th, 1979, a co-worker of hers agreed to pick her up to take her to work. So he arrived to the Orchard Apartments there in Houston, Texas, which it's now a different name, I believe. And when he approached her door, her door was already partially open. And so he kind of peeked in and he saw Alice lying on the ground with a pillow over the upper half of her body. When he removed the pillow, he found her headless body and it was clear that she had been sexually assaulted. When police arrive, they search everywhere. They cannot find her missing head, and they virtually find no evidence of her attacker. 
Just two weeks later, in the exact same apartment building about two floors up, the body of Mary Michael Calcutta was found inside of her bathroom. She had been stabbed several dozen times, and she was sexually assaulted. It was evident to police that she put up one hell of a fight based on defense wounds, and her attacker was extremely violent. He bent the knife in the process of stabbing her. They believe this killer is also responsible for Alice's murder, but who that person is, nobody knows. There's no witnesses, there's no evidence. This killer left no trace of them behind. And women who lived in this apartment building, obviously, are moving out in groves at that point. The same day that Mary Calcutta was found, a 26-year-old woman named Doris Lynn Threadgill was found murdered inside her apartment, but at a different apartment building. She died by having her throat cut. Police were unsure, though, if she was connected to the other murders. But then two more murders occurred, also in Houston, also in 1979. Police were called because uh, a neighbor heard the sounds of a woman screaming and begging for her life. When police go to the apartment where this happened, again, this is a different apartment complex now, they find a trail of blood, but no body. But then later that day at Watonga Park, which is about four miles away from where this young woman lived, her body was found. It was 16-year-old Joanne Huffman. Within moments, police are notified of a car found a couple miles away that had blood all over it. And so when they arrive, they open the trunk, they find the body of this man, 18-year-old Robert Spangenberger. He was Joanne Huffman's boyfriend. They don't know if these two murders are connected to the others. None of them have been solved. None of them have any forensic evidence. If you have any information, please call 713-884-3131. He picked her simply because she was there. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Corrine Gustafson. Viewer discretion is advised. Corrine Gustafson, who would go by Punky to everybody, she was born on January 2nd, 1986, and she lived in Edmonton, Canada. Punky, pictured here in this home video just two months before this case occurred, she was only six years old. That's how long she got to live. Someone decided to take that away from everybody. Punky lived here in this apartment building with her mom and her aunt. On September 6, 1992, in this recreation from Unsolved Mysteries, Punky was outside her apartment with a friend playing hide-and-go-seek. When, according to the friend, suddenly out of nowhere, a man jumps from behind the fence, grabs Punky, and runs with her. The friend described him as a monster. A young boy was looking out his window and saw Punky being put into a blue van. At the abduction site, police did find these shoe impressions, but they were very unusual because they actually came from a miter brand cleat, not something you see every day. She was reported missing and abducted by her family, and they looked everywhere for her. But sadly, two days later, the search would end. She was found here between two trucks in this truck lot, about nine kilometers away from her home. The six-year-old girl had been smothered to death and she was sexually assaulted. At this particular crime scene next to her body, they also found the same exact pair of cleat impressions. So they knew that this came from her abductor and killer. Oddly enough, I guess her body was found underneath a truck that was owned by her uncle. So her uncle was a suspect at first. However, he would eventually be cleared because of DNA evidence. In March of 2003, police using new DNA technology would take some of the evidence like her clothing and the vaginal swabs they took. They would resubmit all of that for DNA testing and they finally were able to get a profile from her killer. They put that into their database and it comes up with a match from a previously convicted man. A man named Clifford Slay who had previously been convicted of sexual assault. Now he was actually a suspect originally because of the cleats, because he always wore cleats, which was highly unusual. However, his friends and family gave him an alibi. Turns out that was false. And then he eventually just confesses to the murder. He said he got into an argument or a fight with his common law wife, stormed out of the home and intended to find a girl he knew to sexually assault. He couldn't find her. But he saw Punky and her friend playing and he just took her because she was closest to the fence. He originally tried to say he left her alive, but they knew obviously that wasn't true. And then he just fesses up to the murder itself. 
he was convicted and sentenced to life in prison where he could get paroled after 25 years. A mother and son are presumed to have been murdered, but unfortunately their bodies have still never been found. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Renee and Andrew McRae. Viewer discretion is advised. 36-year-old Renee McRae was a mother to two young boys, and the family resided in Iverness in Scotland. I do apologize if I said that wrong. I tried looking it up. Renee was separated from her ex-husband, Gordon. It was assumed at that time that Renee had been having an affair with uh, a man whose name was William or Bill McDowell. This affair did start happening before the separation with Renee and her husband Gordon. William McDowell actually worked for Renee's husband Gordon. He was, because I guess Gordon owned some company and he served as accountant slash secretary. William himself was also married with two kids. It was Friday, November 12th, 1976. Renee would get into the vehicle, her car, with her two sons. She dropped nine-year-old Gordon off at his father's house, Gordon uh, Sr. When she left, she turned south and she went on to the A9. But Renee and her three-year-old son, Andrew, from that moment on, had never been seen again. That same night, about 12 miles away, Renee's BMW vehicle was found completely on fire and burnt to a crisp, was charred. There was apparently a blood-stained rug, which when they tested it, all they were able to do back then was test it for blood type, and it matched Renee's known blood type. But there was no sign of Renee or Andrew in the vehicle. According to some witnesses, people who had drove by this area saw what appeared to be a man dragging what they thought was a sheep off the road. Renee was wearing a sheepskin type uh, coat. Another witness saw someone pushing a stroller or buggy, I guess as they would call it, which would have matched up because little Andrew was still being pushed around in one. So Renee and Andrew are missing. And at this point, given the bloodstained rug, the burned out car, I mean, this was all pretty much, you have to believe that this was a murder, that these two individuals were killed. But by who and why? Well, they did find out about William McDowell, and they did interview him and question him. They never really felt that he was being completely truthful about any potential involvement in this, but they also never really had any physical proof to say, first of all, that the two were actually dead for sure, or that he had anything to do with it. And this case really kind of goes cold pretty quickly. Over the years, they've done very extensive searches. They have searched a couple of quarries and other like large properties. At one point they found something that kind of gave off a horrific scent, like it could have been a dead body, but there wasn't a body there. They dug up another location, but all they really found was like chip bags and some men's clothing, which wouldn't have matched up with the two missing people. They also kind of got tips through people that the two were probably buried underneath the A9, because there was some, I guess, construction or some work being done on the A9 around the time of the disappearance. But they did a lot of look-throughs with like aerial maps and whatnot, and they determined that they were likely not buried under the A9. But there were witnesses who stated that they saw a man digging uh, some kind of hole, kind of off or near the A9. I believe this was like 40 some odd years later when they found out that a man sort of matching William McDowell's description was the man who was seen digging a hole near the road. It wouldn't be until about 2019 or so when they start to reopen this case as a cold case. During this kind of new investigation, they uncovered some information that a, a man had been spoken to by William McDowell and William McDowell asked this man if he would kill both Renee and Andrew for him. They also found out through witnesses that William McDowell had completely removed and burnt the flooring of his own vehicle literally the day after the two disappeared. Then they discovered that the father, the biological father of Andrew McRae, was William McDowell. Through re-interviewing people, they learned that William McDowell was terrified of this affair coming out public, you know, way back then, 
and that it would risk his career and his livelihood. It would destroy his marriage and his family. And that was the likely motive as to why he did this. They found out that William McDowell had essentially told Renee that, hey, you know, take it, let's take Andrew. We'll take him on a little a vacation, right? And that's who she was supposed to be meeting that day. William also lied about that during the initial part of this investigation, saying that he didn't really have any idea where they were or, you know, what they were doing that day. By 2022, he is formally arrested and charged with the two murders, despite the fact that they have never found either body. Even to this day, they have not discovered their bodies. He also will not say where he put them but everything points against him. I mean, it's a lot of circumstantial evidence for the most part. They don't really have a ton of physical evidence. He would be found guilty of both of their murders. He was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of at least 30 years, but he wouldn't serve that long at all. Just a few months later, where William himself dies in prison at the age of 81 of natural causes and taking with him to the grave, the location of Renee and Andrew McRae. A single cigarette butt sat in an evidence bag for over 50 years when it would finally help solve a murder. Hello, True Crimeers. This is the case of Rita Curran. Viewer discretion is advised. Rita was born to Thomas and Mary Curran on June 21st, 1947, and she had two siblings, a sister named Mary and a brother named Thomas. It was a close-knit family. Rita and her sister Mary were like the best of friends. At the time this case occurred, Rita had just moved into her own apartment for the first time, and that was in Burlington, Vermont. Rita was a second grade teacher at Milton Elementary School, a job she absolutely loved. Rita was a talented singer. She was kind, she was smart, she was hardworking, and her students at school absolutely adored her. But sadly, one day in 1971, her students would be devastated to find out she was murdered. It was the night of July 20th, 1971. Rita, who lived with a couple of roommates, the roommates were out most of that night, but they came home to a nightmare. They found their roommate Rita had been brutally beaten and she was deceased. The apartment was in a little bit of disarray, but nothing too bad and nothing appeared to be stolen. There was also blood in the bedroom, which came from when the attacker was beating her and they found in the room a discarded cigarette butt. Thankfully, they collected this cigarette butt and they stored it properly. Even back in 1971 when DNA technology wasn't a thing yet, but thank goodness they did. There was also other forensic, like biological type evidence they found at the crime scene and some evidence they didn't realize had biological evidence until many, many, many years later. They questioned everyone that was a part of her life. She had no enemies. She didn't have any ex-boyfriends that were like jealous or angry. They just didn't really know who did this and why. The house had no forced entry, so someone entered through an unlocked door, they believe. But unfortunately, this case would go unsolved for decades. Both of Mary's parents would pass away before they ever found out who did this to their daughter. In 2023, a cold case team was working this case and they found the cigarette butt in an evidence bag. They tested it for any kind of DNA and they got a hit. They ran it through the forensic genealogy, familial DNA, that type of thing. And eventually it led them to the family of this man here, William DeRuz. He lived in the apartment building and he lived just upstairs with his wife. They would re-interview his wife many years later. They found out that she provided a false alibi for him. He did not know Rita. He got into a fight with his wife that night and he left the apartment to blow off some steam. They believe he then entered her apartment, sexually assaulted her and murdered her. He'll never face justice. He died in 1986. Touch DNA would help solve a 33 year old cold case. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Rose Nath viewer discretion is advised. I don't really have a lot of information about Rose, unfortunately. I do know that she was born on October 26, 1910, and she lived her entire life in Pennsylvania. Rose would later marry, but unfortunately her husband had passed away, so at the time of this case she is a widow. She never had children of her own, but she was really close to all the kids in her family, like nieces and nephews and things like that. And she was also very, very involved in her faith, and she would go to church every single weekend. 
Which is why on Sunday, January 22nd, 1989, when she did not arrive at church, everyone thought this was very, very strange. So one of her nephews would end up going to her house that Sunday morning after church to see if she was okay. When he entered the home, which was unlocked, he found his aunt. She was in a pool of blood, and there was a very obvious sign of a struggle throughout the house. It appeared that Rose had tried to run from her attacker, just based on everything the way it looked like in the house. There was blood in many rooms, but ultimately she had been bludgeoned and stabbed to death. And they also found a pellet gun uh, at the house, or outside the house. Rose Nath had been killed in her Lehigh County, Pennsylvania home, likely the night before. But unfortunately, her case went pretty cold pretty quickly because she's a 78-year-old widow who's living in this house alone. She didn't have any enemies or anyone that hated her or anything like that, so they just assumed that this was a very random murder. She had been robbed, and actually she had reported her house was robbed a few days prior as well. And this time when her body was found, her house was completely ransacked. Someone had gone through the entire home, stealing whatever they could steal. Now, thankfully, police collected a bunch of evidence from the crime scene. And even though touch DNA wasn't even a thing back in 1989, they still managed to preserve everything they collected, and they preserved it beautifully. 33 years later, they would announce they finally have a suspect arrested. This is because several of those items that they collected, like murder weapons and other items, they found touch DNA. And it led to a man that was already in their system. A now 65-year-old man named Michael Breisch. He was living in Ohio at the time he was arrested, which was just this year in 2024. Like, he was arrested just in May, so less than a month ago. That's all they've really released right now, though. It doesn't sound like they knew each other, he and Rose, that this was likely a random burglary. He was actually supposed to be in jail at the time of her murder, but he escaped. But his trial is obviously still pending. So hopefully very soon, Rose gets the justice she deserves. It would take nine years to find her body. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Rosemary Christensen. Viewer discretion is advised. Rosemary Christensen was actually born in Australia back in 1955. At one point, she was married to a European diplomat, and the two of them had two children together. But then, after a divorce, Rosemary would move to the States, specifically to Florida, where by 1996, she had met a man named Robert Temple on an online chat room. Within a year, they were married. Rosemary then quickly got her real estate license, and she became a realtor. The last time anyone saw Rosemary was on August 26, 1999. She was supposed to go to work the following morning, but she never showed up. Her co-workers tried reaching her, but they couldn't reach her. And so by August 30th, her co-workers report her missing, not her husband. Robert Temple says he last saw his wife on August 26, 1999 at around 7 p.m. This is when police learned that Robert was having an affair with a much younger woman named Leslie. Police found out that Rosemary found out about this affair and she was threatening a divorce. Robert had always been a very controlling and at times abusive husband. When questioned by police, he also tells them that both of them were swingers. And he suspected that Rosemary met a man online and maybe ran off with him. They end up taking their computer in for evidence, and they do find out that Rosemary had recently been talking to a man, but he never met her actually in person, and they were able to clear that man of any wrongdoing. Meanwhile, Rosemary is missing, and police genuinely suspect that her husband did something to her, but they have no evidence or proof of it. He did buy a whole bunch of cleaning supplies literally within days of her disappearance, which to them said he was cleaning up a possible murder scene, they even find evidence that a section of carpet had been cut out and removed recently. But again, there wasn't any blood evidence. Robert Temple goes on the news crying and saying he would rather be dead than not have Rosemarie come home. And he begged her to come home. Nine years later in 2008, a woman comes forward to break everything wide open. Back in 1999, Leslie Stewart was 22 years old and she was the one having the affair with Robert, a co-worker. She finally comes to police and says that she was forced to hide the body of Rosemary. 
Leslie leads police to this area in Gilchrist County, which is in Florida, which is where this took place. And eventually, they, she points out the area where she was buried, where police uncover a giant blue tub and they find Rosemary's body inside. Robert Temple was promptly arrested and charged with her murder. He confessed to the murder to Leslie. He threatened to murder Leslie if she did not help him hide Rosemary's body, and threatened to kill her if she told anyone about it. For the next nine years, Leslie stays with Robert because she's terrified of leaving him because of how many times he threatened to harm her or kill her. Eventually, Leslie gets into contact with, I think, Robert's lawyer that he had at the time, and she tells the lawyer exactly where Rosemary's body was, but unfortunately, because of attorney-client privilege, he was not allowed to say where the body was. And he would later be interviewed saying how horrible he felt and how shitty he felt because he wasn't allowed to say anything unless there was proof that he was, that Robert was going to commit a murder, a future murder. This is the, the dark side of attorney-client privilege. But eventually, I think he, I'm not sure if he helps convince Leslie to go forward to police or not, but thankfully Leslie did, and that's what led to finding Rosemary's body. Robert Temple goes on trial, and he doesn't have an attorney representing him because he represents himself. He swears up and down that he had nothing to do with this. But the testimony of, of Leslie was incredibly damning. She actually revealed in her testimony because her and Robert actually had a very young child together and Robert had threatened to kill their child if she ever said anything. That's why it took her nine years to finally come forward because she's also being physically abused and emotionally abused and controlled by this man. Robert Temple was eventually found guilty of first degree murder and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. In December of 2018, when he was the great-great-grandfather of the Crypt Keeper, he died in prison. He had already been going through a sea of health issues when he was arrested, and it sounds like it's those health issues that eventually claimed his life. One can only hope that it was incredibly painful and uncomfortable for him. He just freely walked out of an elementary school and has never been seen again. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Ryan Larson. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Ryan Larson, pictured here with his mom Tammy, was 11 years old, and he was attending La Vista West Elementary School, which is in La Vista, Nebraska. Ryan was one of four kids. He was the only boy, so he had three older sisters, and he got along with all of them really well. It was a it's a very close knit family. Ryan loved playing with matchbox cars, with army figurines, he loved Legos, and he really loved to pull pranks on people. They would describe him as kind of like a mechanical wind-up bug. He would just have fun and he loved to laugh and to make other people laugh. Ryan is also on the autism spectrum and suffers from epilepsy and Tourette's. On May 17th, 2021, Tammy dropped Ryan off at school and then she went off to work. But at 12.27 p.m., Tammy received a phone call that would change her life forever. The school notified her that Ryan just simply walked off of the school's campus and has not been seen. This was not the first time Ryan had done this. Police have been notified about a half a dozen times of situations like this involving Ryan. But they've always been able to find him fairly quickly. He always had his spots that he would go to. But they checked all of those spots and did not find him this time. They found out that Ryan was having an issue with a math problem that day. And so because he's on the spectrum, he has he has like a special individual education plan where if he's having an issue like that, he can be moved to a different classroom to calm down. They said that he was in the transition of moving to another classroom and was left unattended for just a few moments. And when they came back, he was gone. They checked their footage there on the school, the CCTV, and they see him walking away from the school. However, that image has not been released to the public. Like I said, normally when this happens, he's found really quickly, but it's now been three years and Ryan still hasn't been found. I know initially they searched very, very thoroughly for him. He wasn't at any of his normal spots. He wasn't anywhere else on the campus. He wasn't at his apartments. Within the first year, they've been able to get like Google and cell phone data to kind of like see what was going on in that area around that time. But to my knowledge, nothing has come from that. They have searched bodies of water. This is like an area he had gone to before, but they have not physically found him at all. 
I know at one point cadaver dogs picked up on some kind of human decay at this lake, but he hasn't been found there. Police seem to be pretty unsure if foul play was involved, but they're not 100% positive. They don't think a stranger was involved. They think if he went with someone, it was someone he knew. Or maybe an accident took place and someone's trying to hide it. But they need your help. If you have information, please call 402-592-7867. He fell 200 feet from this cliff. Was it murder? Was it suicide? And was it a hate crime? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Scott Johnson. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Scott Johnson was actually living in Australia, but he was born in California in 1961. Scott, pictured here with his brother Steve, had come out as being gay sometime in the early 80s. In 1983, Scott had graduated top of his class from the California Institute of Technology, Caltech. He then moved to England, where he went to the University of Cambridge. While studying there, Scott had met his future partner, Matthew Noon, who was Australian. So Scott would actually move to Australia in 1986 to live with his partner. While there, he would attend the Australian National University, where he would go for his PhD. By 1988, he pretty much was just about to earn his PhD. But he would not get to do anything with it, because he would not have a future. On the morning of December 10th, 1988, here at this cliffside, which is at Bluefish Point in a Sydney suburb uh, called Manly, the badly broken body of a young man was found at the bottom of this cliff. This is an artist rendering, but at the top of the cliff was some clothes neatly folded with shoes and identification. The body was then identified as Scott Johnson, 27 years old. And pretty much right away, they ruled it a suicide. His family back in the States just couldn't believe that, and, and that just didn't make sense. He was just, he was earning his PhD, and he was happy. His partner, Matthew, would tell police that about six months prior, Scott had cheated on Matthew, and that potentially Scott was feeling really awful about it, and maybe that's what led to him just jumping off the cliff. There were no other signs of foul play at this cliff site. There were no witnesses who saw this. There was no forensic evidence to be collected. And so it was ruled a suicide and they just closed it and said, all right, let's move on. But his family would not give up. Over the decades, his brother Steve would continue pushing police to say, please investigate this further. They actually did like coroner inquests, not once, but twice. And each of those times they still ruled it a suicide. Well, in the 80s and the early 90s, especially in Sydney, Australia, there was a high influx of hate crimes against gay people. In fact, in that time frame, roughly 80 men had been killed in hate crimes, beaten by roaming bands of teenagers. Not to mention the 80 to 100 more that weren't killed, but were violently attacked and robbed. And they would learn that people in prison had confessed to, at points, pushing gay men off of cliffs. And his brother then said, we need to look at this as a homicide. Steve and his other siblings as well, they fought like hell for justice to get done for their brother. They knew that he did not do this to himself. That just did not make sense to them. And now when finding out how in the late 80s and the early 90s, how all of this attacks on gay people, murders of gay people, Scott had recently come out in the early 80s, was openly gay. It fit the pattern of this not being a suicide, but likely a hate crime murder. And finally, the authorities in Australia did the right thing. After a third inquest, they ruled that they don't believe that his death was actually a suicide. So they began to put out feelers out to the public. We need to ask, the, you know, who was around at this time. If you know anything about this, please come forward and they actually got a very significant break. The wife of this man here at the time, 52-year-old Scott White, would tell police that she basically believed that he was the one to actually kill Scott Johnson. So police then did this undercover sting operation where they would like promise this guy a lot of money and they would end up bringing him out to the cliffside where this whole thing happened and he admitted to doing it. He said he was the one, he punched Scott Johnson and he fell off the cliff. Scott said that he himself, Scott White, 
was gay. He was 18 years old at the time of this case. However, he was very closeted at that time and remained closeted, I think, until all of this came out in 2020. He said he punched Scott Johnson first, Scott Johnson punched him back, and then Scott White punched the other Scott back. That time he fell off of this cliff and Scott White did nothing to help him. He just walked away. He didn't report it to police. He didn't try to get help. He did nothing. He let Scott Johnson lay at the bottom of that cliff and die. Now, Scott Johnson's wallet was also stolen and Scott was nude as well. So they don't really know if this was like a robbery or if maybe Scott White was about to engage in some sort of sexual interaction with Scott Johnson and he decided no and didn't want to risk it because he didn't want anyone knowing he was gay and maybe he that's what led to it. They don't really know for sure. But he was arrested in Australia and he was charged initially with the murder, which he would then get convicted of and only sentenced to 12 years in prison. And then just a few, a short time after this, the conviction was overturned and he was then, I guess, given an option to plead guilty to manslaughter, where he was resentenced to nine years in prison with the possibility of parole after six years. It's probably not the greatest justice, but it is finally justice. And this is all because his brother Steve fought like absolute hell to get justice for his brother. And he and his family were right the entire time. Meanwhile, violence against the LGBTQIA continues to this very day, worldwide. This is another missing or murdered indigenous person case, and this is the case of Seth DeChambeau. Viewer discretion is advised. Seth Deschambeau, I'm hoping I'm saying his last name right, I'm having a hard time finding the pronunciation of it, but at the time of this case, he had just turned 18 years old. Seth was a member of the Cumberland House Cree Nation, and that is in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan in Canada. Seth was last seen on May 29th, 2022, and I believe from what I understand, he was wearing this exact outfit, or at least the, the red sweater, I think is what he was seen wearing. Seth had actually been raised by his aunt since he was three months old, and she said the last time she spoke to him was just a few days prior on May 27th. Seth was soon to be graduating from high school, and he planned to at some point attend college. He wasn't sure what he wanted to do, but he knew he wanted to pursue something. He was also really, really good at basketball. He loved playing it. He was an incredibly smart young man, very intelligent. And basically, the world was going to be his oyster. But then something happened on May 29th, 2022. And really, nobody knows what it is that happened. All they really know is that Seth had said he was going to a party that was going to be going on that entire weekend. He never came home from that party. He's never been seen again. And there's really very, very little information about what they've investigated and what's going on with it. The RCMP has said that they believe that he was the victim of homicide and that Seth is very likely deceased, but they don't have proof of that. His aunt, who has heard rumors and stuff like that, believes that one person was responsible for his death, but several people, maybe even up to 10 different people, knew what happened and possibly helped cover it up. And that those friends are so close that none of them are spilling the beans. So she's hoping that there is some kind of fallout amongst this group of friends and that helps one of them, just one, come forward to say what they know. His aunt just wants him back in whatever capacity that is. She has pled out to the public, to the person who may have done something to him or knows what happened to him. She has said, quote, just grab my hand and lead me to the spot and then walk away. No questions asked. We don't care what happened, what went down. God saw everything and God will be the judge of that. End quote. Somebody has to know what happened to Seth. I mean, definitely somebody knows. If you're afraid of someone retaliating against you, you can always report your information anonymously. You don't have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. He deserves to be brought home to his family. And if justice needs to be served, he deserves that too. If you have information, please call 1-800-222-8477. Jesus, ugh. if you see this man, he is a dangerous wanted fugitive. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Tammy Palmer. Viewer discretion is advised. This case occurred in 2012 in the town of Stony Point, New York. 39-year-old Tammy Palmer lived here in this home with her two children and her estranged husband. 
She was the mother to these two children, Rosemary and John, and it's more than obvious that they absolutely loved their mom. But Tammy, at the time this case occurred, is going through essentially a really rough divorce. Tammy and her husband, John, it was a very contentious and very just messy, messy, messy divorce. It got to a point where Tammy had to file a restraining order against him. And this guy here is Tammy's father-in-law, John's dad, Eugene Palmer. Well, apparently he was not very happy with Tammy and I guess whatever she was doing throughout this divorce proceeding. And so on the morning of September 24th, 2012, Tammy walked her two children to the bus stop and then she began to walk back towards her home. Just outside of her house, she was confronted by her father-in-law, Eugene. He raised a gun and he fired at her. Tammy fell to the ground and she had been killed killed by her own father-in-law. Eugene Palmer promptly fled the scene in his pickup truck, and at first they believed that he had gone somewhere deep into the woods nearby. Everybody knew it was him who did this. There was no disputing it. The problem is, is they couldn't find him. His truck was later found and it was abandoned outside of a park, but Eugene was nowhere to be found. Eugene was then promptly charged with second-degree murder, and with a, within a short period of time, he was added to the FBI's 10 Most Wanted Fugitive list. Eugene is known as an expert survivalist. He had spent a lot of time in the woods. He was an, an avid camper, hiker. He was a hunter. He had been for most of his life. And they truly believe that he is someone fully capable of living off the land for as long as he needed to. He has since been removed from the 10 most wanted list. However, he is still considered a wanted fugitive. This is essentially the most recent photo of him, but at this point, he would now be about 85 years old. His family, his direct family says he's probably dead. He probably died of some sort of health issue, but there's no proof of that. And of course they might say that just so people might stop looking for him. But there's also a very strong chance he is still alive out there and he is armed and he is dangerous. If you have any information about his whereabouts, you can contact the U.S. Marshals at 1-800-336-0102. You can also submit a tip online on the U.S. Marshals website. It may have taken 44 years, but this murder was finally solved. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Vicki Belk. Viewer discretion is advised. Vicki Lynn Belk was born on March 20th, 1951 in Alexandria, Virginia. She would go on to graduate from T.C. Williams High School in 1969. She then went on to get her Bachelor of Arts degree in Education, and that was from St. Augustine College in Raleigh, North Carolina. At the time of this case, Vicki was 28 years old and she was the mother to a seven-year-old boy named Lamont. Vicki herself was one of six siblings. She was a very proud member of the Oakland Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia. And by 1979, she's actually working at the Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And that's also where her boyfriend worked. On August 28, 1979, Vicki would be reported missing. She was reported missing by her boyfriend, who had not seen her since the day prior when they last saw each other at work. Once he found out that she never got back to her apartment and her family hadn't heard from her or seen her, he became worried and called the police. The very next evening, here in this grassy area, a teenager who was riding his bike found a body. The body was just thrown onto the side of the road as if it were garbage, and the victim had been shot to death and was also sexually assaulted. The body would soon be identified as 28-year-old mother Vicki Lynn Belk. Nobody knew who would do this to her. Her boyfriend was more than cooperative with police, and it didn't sound like they ever really thought of him as a suspect. They didn't really have any suspects, actually. This case goes cold very quickly. About 44 years later, police resubmit the evidence that they had collected, and they preserved it really well. And they did so to test it for DNA, since DNA has obviously advanced a lot. And they actually found some plentiful DNA. And when they entered it into the database, they got a match. It came back to a man, 63-year-old Andre Taylor. His DNA was all over, like, the body and her clothing and all that. He never came up on police's radar back then. 
Andre was 18 years old at the time this murder happened. He did not know Vicky. Vicky did not know him. They never crossed paths before. So this was obviously just a chance encounter and a random act of violence. So the murder happened and the body was found in uh, Maryland. So Maryland is the one that's moving this case forward. So the arrest happened towards the middle of 2023. And according to Maryland's judicial records, his trial, I believe, is scheduled for July of 2024. And so hopefully, finally, after 44 years, hopefully Vicky gets the justice she rightfully deserves.